Welcome to Flat Earth Smarts. So, you think the world is flat. For what it's worth, so do I. Why? It's simple. It looks flat. And there's nothing can be done to prove otherwise. If there was, the scientists would have done it a long time ago. The fact remains that they can't. So, where to from here? Let's get something out of the way before we go any further. It'll save the naysayers watching further. Flat Earth Smart will not provide some magic proof that the Earth is flat. I came to Flat Earth a few years ago. Don't concern yourself with how, except to say that I was on board with this when the story broke in 2015, and it afforded me the luxury of being able to sit back and watch it unfold without the need to weigh up the arguments. So why this now? Because there's not enough hours in the day. You undoubtedly walked into this without expecting it. You didn't go to school to learn about the earth being flat. You didn't attend a college course to find out about it. Most likely, you were bumming around on the internet or killing time on YouTube and decided that you'd have a look at this ridiculous idea and shut those dumb flat earthers up once and for all. If you're like me, you grew up on a globe. This is one of the few subjects that are taught from a start position of ridicule. How many of us heard those stupid people in the olden days thought the earth was flat? Aren't they stupid? Well, guess what? It's 2016 and there's more questions now on the subject than there ever have been. I won't be labouring you with them for a moment. As I said a moment ago, I don't have the magic proof, and I don't have a silver bullet that will kill the globe either. It's undoubted that YouTube's provided many of us, myself included, with lots of things to think about. So what's to be done with it all? There are not enough hours in the day to watch and think on all that people have to say on the subject. Maybe it's time to get smart on how we look into it. If you let YouTube lead you, you'll be bounced from one opinion to the next. None of them will agree with each other. Some will have good points and some will be not so good. So, at the risk of sounding all biblical, how to separate the wheat from the chaff? If you've just come to this, perhaps the best suggestion is to turn off your computer for today, go to bed with a warm drink and wake up ready to start on it tomorrow. If you've gotten this far, one more night and a good sleep is not going to stop you here. You will not find the answers if you stay up looking for the one video that will answer the matter. When you wake up in the morning, you can start and you'll have the rest of your days to look for some answers. But before you do, there's a few questions that you can answer and you won't find the answers on YouTube or on the internet. If you can answer these questions for yourself, you can steer your own way through this maze and hopefully you won't be swayed a long way by anybody else. Can you put everything you've learned about the world to one side for a while and look at a subject with a clean sheet of paper? Can you accept that what you think you know about the world might be wrong? Can you accept that everyone makes mistakes, even scientists? Can you believe in something that nobody else seems to completely agree with or that people think is plain dumb? Can you form an opinion based entirely on things that you have discovered for yourself? Can you hold belief that is unpopular among the people that you believe you know well? Can you make a decision about a hot topic and defend it? While answering yes to these questions is a good indicator of how well you know your own mind, don't be put off too much if you're wavering on a few of them. Remember, you don't have to paint your beliefs on a banner and parade them down the local high street. First and foremost, they will be your answers and nobody has the right to question them. Once you're settled in yourself, the journey gets a little easier. So, I'll leave this here for now and add to them as time goes on. Oh, I know you open this expecting to find the clinching answers to all your questions, but like I said, I don't have them yet. But let's see if we can smooth the way. 
By the time you watch this, I'll have uploaded number two, and you can start there. For what it's worth, let's hope you learn something towards navigating your way through the flat earth. For those who've realised that the earth is flat, the subject usually hits them like a steam train. Lies hit people in different ways, and without doubt, the globe is one of the biggest lies ever told. Once the initial impact has subsided and a few early questions have been gotten out of the way, most of us wanted to tell someone else. If we had figured this out, surely others would want to know too. I'm sure many of us questioned whether we were losing our marbles, even if we only thought so, quietly. Some of us were fortunate enough to get a sensible reception to our news, or that it was accepted with respectful silence. Others have seen the total onslaught that comes from someone who still believes the earth is a ball. And so I ask you to spare a thought, for a moment, for someone who still thinks the earth is a sphere of some description. Given that flat earthers are, at best, considered to be some quaint throwback to days gone by, should we be too surprised at the response we get? For many, the first person you probably told was someone that's close. Have you ever wondered what their first thought was on hearing of your discovery? At first, it sounds like something from a bad comedy, and at its worst, it's seen as a first sign of madness. For some, our nearest and dearest will have eventually come to a point where they sat back quietly and watched as you seemed to sink. At that stage, it seems to take one of two broad paths. Complete apathy seems to be the most popular course of action thus far, as if to say, I'll leave him or her alone until they realise how dumb it sounds. Or they'll try to snap you out of it with all the usual objections of which I'll speak later. While you'll have taken some time to settle into the truths of the matter, eventually you'll have seen enough proofs to satisfy yourself and the case is, for all intents and purposes, now closed. But put yourself in their shoes for a moment. This subject probably sounds, to them, as ridiculous as someone telling you that the moon is made of green cheese. It means nothing without some shred of evidence that it might be true. After all, isn't that what got you started in all of this? In many ways, to a non-believer, this should be no different than meeting someone who believes in God. There's something somewhere that strikes us deep beneath the surface and it's not an experience you can give to someone else. For each of us, something simply clicked at the right moment and after that we began to see the world differently. There's little doubt that each of us, in weighing up the evidence, eventually found the one thing that tipped the balance and it's undoubted that it's different for each of us. Some think flat water is all the proof they need. Others are satisfied that telescopes can't see over curved horizons, and so it's because each of us is different that it's always a hard subject to prove to someone else. So if you took as long as you did to find your own proof, after the subject caught your attention, what makes you think someone else will believe you when you go to them? Remember, it's not that long ago that you believed we all lived on a ball flying through space too. I've told maybe a half dozen people, and the reactions have ranged from 30 minutes and they're cool with the idea, right up to a stony silence and tumbleweeds blowing down the street. Yes, there are people who seem to think that they know the shape of the world, and for some reason they believe it is their mission to put the stupid flat earthers straight. I'm not too concerned by someone who thinks he has to teach me a lesson, and neither should you be. We are all more than capable of going out and finding out for ourselves the subjects that we want to know more about. And rather quickly, 
you'll find that it doesn't take huge amounts of information to satisfy yourself. In fact, it takes surprisingly little, and most of us had only two or three things that were enough to finally convince us. There are hundreds of proofs that the world is flat, and it only takes two or three. The trick is to know which two or three work for any one person. No two people are alike. It's a little ironic that people still think they can debunk Flat Earth with one video or, as I've seen on more than one occasion, with one photograph. Flat Earthers are not likely to see one picture and suddenly say, oh silly me, it's a ball after all. Most of us looked long and hard before we eventually got here. Flat Earth is really not for the faint-hearted. It takes a degree of courage to say yes, some scientists are wrong even Einstein. Finally, perhaps, if each of us wants to go tell someone else about this wonderful thing we've discovered, we might be wise to avoid opening a conversation by telling people that they are brainwashed. Nobody likes to be told they're brainwashed, especially the brainwashed. And let us not forget that we were in exactly the same position at some point too. It will be hard for anyone to look at this matter without some reservations. After all, history claims to have sorted this one out centuries ago, depending on who you listen to. There will always be some who will refuse to even look at the subject. They seem to consider themselves above all of this, and you would do well if you simply left them to blow their steam elsewhere. They're normally quite easy to recognize, they claim to know more than you do. They usually speak to people as if they're talking to a six-year-old, and they tend to fill their hungry arguments with copious expletives. Your time will be better spent elsewhere. So, in closing, let us spare a thought for others and put ourselves in their shoes for just a moment, and they will trust that your judgment is at least as sound as anyone else's. So, you've gotten yourself over the initial bump that is Flat Earth, and as you've already seen, there are more questions. So, put your questions to one side for a moment. Flat Earth is not an open and shut case. If it were, you'd have found your answers and would now be happily exploring some other fact of life. Flat Earth is, to some extent, a unique subject. It is also a massive subject that reaches across so many things in this world. If you're looking to find answers that are in any way related to the shape of the Earth, each question starts with a hurdle. How do you ask somebody how the moon works if they think you live on a ball? You'll get the stock answer that it reflects sunlight, and are likely to get little more than that unless you add that you also think the Earth is flat too. So you have to explain your flat Earth thing first then. Provided you don't send people scurrying for cover, you might get a better answer to your moon question. The alternative, and this seems to be the preferred alternative, is to seek all your new flat Earth related answers from other flat Earthers. That presents you with another set of complications. The Flat Earth community, as most of us know it, is an extremely new community. Virtually nobody was asking these questions up until a couple of years ago, and the sources were relatively scarce. So you have questions that most people think are dumb to begin with. It can seem a little lonely at first. Here you have this wonderful new truth which most people want to tell everyone else about, and nobody to tell it to. There are enough flat earth nut cases to go around, and some to spare, so which ones do you listen to? Let's be clear at this stage, as in all things, there is good and bad, and that's without the added complication of some who simply want to spread disinformation. You will undoubtedly want to build your own list of people whose opinions you have learned to trust in this matter, 
and an unfortunate side effect is that we each build our own network of people. Indeed, if you read any good psychology book, you'll find that the factors on which each of us builds trust in someone else are too numerous to count. But I would like to pull one thread from that particular garment, that different personalities can be harmonious or they can be troubled, and there's no quick fix by which to get through them. And so, you will have to wade through them all for yourself and decide whose opinion you value. And please, don't make the mistake of thinking that you can get the full measure of someone by watching them on YouTube. Remember, politicians have crafted selling a personality into a fine art. And the good guys have bad days too. For some reason, Flat Earth has been co-opted into the truth movement whatever that may be, and with it, people have attached a whole range of attributes and expect everyone to suddenly adopt them without question. Deciding that the Earth is flat does not instantly make you into an honest and upright citizen of the world, although it is granted that most flat earthers can smell the proverbial bull a mile away and don't care to smell it for long. In short, I'm sure there are some liars murderers, psychopaths, and other dysfunctional personalities who think the world is flat too. One of the more unique qualities of the Flat Earthers is that they are not intent in finding a leader. The Flat Earth community, for want of a better phrase, is somewhat organic. Flat Earth does not have a head office or headquarters where great directives are issued and complied with. Where you go, and more particularly whose advice you choose to hear is entirely up to you. Individual reactions range from a non-committal so what the earth is flat to a more boisterous get your pitchforks and let's go and burn some space agencies down. Neither will achieve solid results in the long run. As I've said a couple of times in the first instance you don't need to go and do anything. Take your time and see who goes where. It's not for any of us to be concerned about who is sleeping with whom, and it's not for us to put anyone in charge of this. It won't take you long to start figuring out who is worth listening to. For my part, I don't put much store in people who hide behind anonymous electronic names. If you put your trust in the arrangement of a few pixels on a screen, you are likely to gather nothing more than a few dots. Yes, this subject does engender a somewhat conspiratorial mindset, but against that, the only alternative is complete anonymity, which is as bad, if not worse. Some prefer to take the opposing view. In other words, they loudly proclaim themselves and all their worth and expect instant recognition and, while they can occasionally be a little tiring, I am inclined to give them a little more credibility. Yes, some have chosen to build themselves a career in the Flat Earth community. It's not for us to oppose or endorse them one way or another. There's nothing wrong in making a living doing something you enjoy, and in the right place they also attract others and bring good things together. So take something from their success. After all, what's to stop you doing the same thing? In the final analysis, I'm inclined to put a little more store in those who are open and generally accessible. Some of the more recognisable names have been more than open about how you can get in touch with them, and while some have done nothing more than give a few contact details, others have been more than prepared to respond and should be appreciated for their time and effort. Let's remember that we are all private citizens and, as such, are entitled to a private life. Your opinion about the shape of the earth can really only be based on one thing, that is, proof that meets your own standards. I trust Mark will forgive me for using his example, but if your reason for deciding the world is flat boils down to That nice Mr Sergeant said so! It is really nothing more than the same house of cards that has been used to build the globe for so many years. There are good flat earthers out there, and while I am sure they have their own bad days, on balance their counsel is sound. 
Some have done some wonderful experiments. Some have drawn some wonderful diagrams and others seem to have a gift for putting the most complex arguments into plain speech. None of them have all the answers and it can be a useful skill to simply see how others look at a problem. If flat earth was an open and shut case then nobody would have any need to argue further. But it's not an open and shut case and we do argue. And finally don't lose sight of the fact that some people floating around Flat Earth really don't care one way or the other and have turned YouTube into something of a Facebook on steroids. It's entertainment, it costs less than a TV license, but their input is no more valuable than the evening news. Your mission, should you choose to accept, is to find the good ones and simply listen. So, what brought you here? What brought you this far? As I've said once, and I'll probably say again several times, you didn't go to school or college to learn that the Earth is flat. Something somewhere made you stop and think, even if it was just for a moment. So perhaps it was just for a moment, but it caught your attention for long enough to make you ask more. Like most of us, you decided to look for more, but from the moment you took your first steps into the flat earth, you were undoubtedly bombarded with a thousand opinions. So put the brakes on for a moment and cast your mind back to that first question you formed about the shape of your world. Did you ever find that first answer? Or were you swamped with a thousand more questions? And if you got the answer to your very first question, what was your second question? Pretty soon, you were running in a thousand directions, looking for a thousand answers. So let's return to your gotcha moment and ask yourself the $64,000 question. Do you still think the world is flat? If you do, you'll likely have a bunch of other questions about the details and if you don't then you're probably still looking for something to prove it to yourself. So keep going, you'll get there. Either way, you have or you will come to a point where you find that one special answer. For many, there are lots of individual answers. None seem to stand alone but each one adds to a weight of evidence which tips the balance. Hold on to those answers. If you're like everyone else, you will still have questions that you're not sure about, but this journey is not about proof, of which I'll say more in a moment. It's about you forming your opinion. Your opinion might not be the same as anyone else's. Your opinion might not be popular with everyone else. Your opinion might even be factually flawed in places, but it is your opinion and it's what makes you who you are. There is a well-founded axiom used in the civil law courts that states an opinion, which is all a court decision amounts to, is to be reached on the balance of probability. It's different to that of the criminal courts where an opinion or verdict must be beyond reasonable doubt. The opinions that each of us hold in this matter need amount to nothing more than the civil court opinion and be on the balance of probability. For some reason, best known to the opponents of the flat earth, their standard of proof seems to ask that it is beyond reasonable doubt. Whenever someone claims to debunk flat earth, they demand scientifically verifiable and repeatable proof. To that, I say, this is not a court of law. Whatever your opinion be, right here, right now, you don't need to prove it to anyone except yourself. What's more, you have the right to change it again if more evidence comes to light. The course can be appealed, why shouldn't you? So, for whatever opinion you hold on this matter, 
at this moment in time, simply be settled in the fact that you hold an opinion, period. Do you really think those who believe that we live on a little ball, fly through space, went out and proved that for themselves? Of course they didn't. So what right do they have to demand you prove anything to them? Just satisfy yourself, that's enough for now. If you reach the stage of holding an opinion, irrespective of whether you think the earth is flat or not, you're probably looking at what to do next. To that, I would say fasten your seatbelt. In short, you're about to discard everything you've been told about the shape of the earth. We all accepted the things we were taught in the past, and generally we didn't question them. But when we did question them, we just used the tools that were handed to us. How many of us went out at night and accepted that the stars we saw were little suns, billions of miles away, that looked like flickering dots in the sky? How many of us accepted that the world was created by some cosmic belch, or that we evolved from sea slime? How many of us think that we are genetically related to monkeys, gorillas, or even bananas? I'm not suggesting throwing the proverbial baby out with the bathwater, rather that we take a closer look at the world around us, and a closer look at the tools with which we do it. So what's the deal with the seatbelt? Once you start to look seriously into the shape of your world, you'll realise there are a thousand different ways you can go, and a thousand different things to look at. Your world will never look the same again. And for every discovery you make, you can take the credit for having discovered it for yourself. The stars will no longer be distant suns because your fifth grade teacher told you they were. I'll not spoil it for you. Go and look for yourself and see what you think they are. This is something that we should all have started to do when we were toddlers. And make no bones about the fact that it's not always easy to learn things. There's not always someone there to tell you the answer. At best, they will tell you their opinion, and we've already seen that it's nothing more than that. Perhaps a good place to start is with deciding which opinions you trust enough to consider. YouTube has attracted some wonderful people, but allied to that, it's also let a few unsavoury characters chime in too. Perhaps it's time to show a little discernment about who and what you listen to. There's more than enough information out there on both sides of the argument, but as in any good court case, it's for you to decide on the credibility of the people and evidence you listen to. I might chip in later with some of the people I've learned to trust, if I think they may help, but in short, this is something each of us must decide for ourselves. I'm just a voice behind a few pictures, and I'm as likely to make mistakes as the next man. If you want to learn something, start building your own collection of people whose opinions you value, and begin there. You deserve the best. Why settle for less? Yes, the Flat Earth does hunger for want of a map. But given that Mercator's masterpiece wasn't made until the 17th century, and even then it was only done to suit the powers that be, let's not be too harsh on those that have offered something else for the flatties amongst us. It doesn't take much of a search to find hundreds of maps that claim to show what the world looks like, but Short of gathering a fleet of ships and a regiment of cartographers, you're not going to make anything amazingly different from those that are already floating around. In the first instance, and while it might not be popular to some of you who are listening to this, the first question is, do we really need a map? When was the last time you got in an aeroplane with a map and found your way to your holiday destination? Beyond having a map to get yourself to the airport, and another to get you from the airport to your hotel, you don't really have a clue where you went. 
the pretty display on the back of the most played seats only lends to an illusion that the world is a ball. Except for the interminable time you'll have sat on the runway waiting to take off, you spent most of the bulk of your journey up above the clouds. Okay, occasionally you may have had to see the odd speck of land, but while the bulk of intercontinental flights are over the oceans, the only other recognisable scenery you'll have seen was on the approach to the airports for what, 10 minutes? Hardly enough time to go mapping the world as you go. This really only matters for those who would like something on which to build their view of the world. No, you don't need a map, but it's a nice thing to have. Like most people, I'm pretty lazy when it comes to the mundane things of life. After all, why keep a dog and bark yourself? No, I'm not about to map the world, but between all those who've attempted to do so, there should be a fairly good idea of what's out there. So, step one is to make a great big pile of all the maps you can find and fish out the rubbish. It makes the pile smaller before going any further. I found that all the maps fall into one of two broad categories. Circular maps with the North Pole in the middle and squarish maps with the North Pole at one of the edges or corners. But before we go any further, I ask you to consider one thing. The sense of scale that's needed when thinking about the maps of the world. I'll use one familiar layout for a moment, as that's all we need at this stage. If we take any of the circular maps with the North Pole at the middle, the world is essentially a disc with a diameter of about 25,000 miles and given us an approximate surface area of about 490,000 square miles. Yes, the surface area is about two and a half times that of the globe, but the extra is mostly oceans and ice. Going upwards, commercial aircraft are limited to 45,000 feet, or about eight and a half miles. The Concorde topped out at 11 miles. Military aircraft fly a little higher, and the International Space Station claims to orbit up to 260 miles. I'll use this map for a moment as it's one of the clearest. This little gap between Canada and Greenland is called the Davis Strait. In reality, it's 190 miles wide, so we can realistically scale 260 miles above the same map that would represent the height at which the ISS claims to orbit. If we draw the surface of the Earth to scale, this little line represents 200 miles. So the blue circle shows how high above the surface 260 miles would be. It's approximately half the width of the Davis Strait again, and shows how high the ISS flies. So the total envelope of airspace in which we are free to fly around and look at the world is this grey area. Any mapping of the world would need to be made from within this envelope. It would be like walking into a room with an extremely low ceiling and trying to see what the whole room looked like from a single standpoint. Or, more realistically, it would be like trying to see the whole room while standing in the pile of a thick carpet. It's realistically impossible. You can try the same thing yourself with any of the maps that claim to show pictures of the world, including the globe itself. Ask yourself, how high can any of us really go before we start claiming to see the whole world at a glance? Or that we can see the curvature, if you still think we live in a ball? If you look closely at all the maps you can find, you'll see rather quickly that they all show roughly the same thing. Yes, some have bits missing, like islands, or in some cases the poles themselves, and others have variously squished the sizes of certain continents to make their own bigger than others. Yes, some men really do have a thing about size, but that's not for us to worry about for now. The two main contenders in this battle are the circular maps that have the North Pole at the middle, and the square maps that have the poles at one of the edges or corners. 
Samuel Rowbottom is not the only person to have made a flat, circular map of the world. The circular maps include Alex Gleason's map from 1892, the Hands Air Age map that was made in 1943, and of course the United Nations flag that was made in the late 1940s, and this old French map that still has New Zealand attached to Antarctica. This layout has been known for centuries. There are many others that show the same layout, and whether you agree with them or not, they are all seem to show the same land masses as each other and have been proven. For all intents and purposes, they work as practical layouts. It's dishonest to continue claiming that every circular map is based on Robotham's work. The square maps are a little more varied but generally show the poles at one of the edges or corners. I'll not belabor you with the magic twilight zones where the sun and the moon fall off one edge and pop up on the other, as we have no credible reason to believe that fact. And if you're serious about finding a working map, it will be disingenuous to hide behind some vague notion of a creator to support this particular flight of fancy. I'll use Alex Gleason's map as the circular layout, and I'll use Mercator's map to pattern the square maps. I'll deal with the other variations as we go along. I use Gleason's map because it's probably the cleanest circular map we have for the time being, and while Mercator's map has been variously pulled and pushed in a variety of directions, it's fairly easy to figure out what goes where. You won't have to look very far to realise that all the maps in either category have their differences. In most cases, they are small islands that are missing, and some variation in the land masses, but it's not hard to find your way around them. So what's the difference between the two? In short, Mercator's map and its variations are square or rectangular and have the poles at one of their edges or corners. The Gleason's map and its relatives are circular and have the North Pole at the middle. There really is nothing that varies outside of these broad guidelines. It's not hard to see how they relate to each other. Most of the time they are passed off as projections and we go round in the same circular arguments getting nowhere. So let's step away from the maps for a moment. The 1950s seems to have been rather busy for those who are interested in the shape of their world. Between chucking nuclear warheads up in the sky to try and bust away through the roof, and the various expeditions to the South Pole that resulted in a few frozen explorers, we seem to have sewn things up quite nicely by the 1960s, and by the end of the next decade we seem to have answered the problems with the roof by telling people that we sent a few guys to the moon. There was perhaps one small wrinkle in the plan though. Kept away from the roof and the edges, the only flaw might be the North Pole. By the 1950s, it was considered to be a done deal. It had been explored several times, and aside from a few polar bears and a ton of snow, there wasn't much up there to see. Even Father Christmas had migrated to Lapland and was nicely tucked up out of the way with his elves. But the North Pole might still give the game away, especially as air travel was becoming easier. So what's so important up there that we might want to see? A cursory look at most world maps seems to suggest that there's nothing up there but water, and lots of it. Perhaps the explorers had paddled their way up there. So how did they stop anyone else sticking their noses in? Let's go back and see what they were up to. By the mid-1950s, the prevailing worry was that those pesky Russians might start lobbing missiles over the North Pole into Canada and the US, and to combat their formidable enemy, the Americans decided to build a great defence line called the Dew Line, from which they could see incoming missiles, real or imagined. The Dew Line runs from the extreme western limit of the US at the Bering Strait, 
across the top of Canada, just below the Arctic Circle, to the eastern coast, then over the Davis Strait to Greenland. A nice long line across the top of the Northern Hemisphere. So, to return to our mapping puzzle, where would the dew line be on a flat map? Any map where Canada is not facing Russia makes the dew line entirely pointless. In every case, it renders the square maps pointless, excepting those that use the twilight zone argument, which would need everyone to rely on falling off one side, missiles and all, and popping back up on the other side in the same instant. The only layout that works for a map of the world, to include the dew line, is to have a circular map on which Canada and Russia face each other across the North Pole. Of course, it would be dishonest if I didn't bring the globe back into the picture as an alternative layout, but it seems that the only workable layouts are on the circular maps or it's back to the globe again. The big question for you to answer is, if the circular map and the globe share the same thing, the only difference is that one of them has a curved surface and the other is flat. People seem to recognise the similarities between them, but for some reason Antarctica seems to puzzle some who can't quite grasp how a deep circular boundary has been condensed into a single landmass. It's almost counterintuitive, so I propose an exercise that I did when I first came to Flat Earth. You can try this for yourself. I used a sheet of tin foil as it holds its shape, but you can do this with a sheet of paper just as easily. Get yourself a small football, one of those seven inch balls is perfect, and measure the circumference. It'll be a little over 21 inches. Now, get your sheet of tin foil and cut out a circle whose diameter matches the circumference of the ball, in this case about 21 inches. Get yourself a marker pen and draw the circular map with Antarctica onto the tinfoil circle. There are no points for artistic merit, but try to keep the land masses proportional. Include the equator and have Antarctica running around the edge. Once you've drawn your map out, wrap it around a ball and hey presto, you have your globe. You'll see that you really only need to scrunch up the southern hemisphere to turn a flat circular map into a globe and Antarctica comes together nicely as a single landmass at the bottom. The circular maps are not that much different from the globe, except that one of them is flat and the other is spherical. If you are honest with your layout, you'll see that the equator still runs around the centre of the sphere and that most of the northern hemisphere matches any other globe. The only real difference is in the southern hemisphere where the land masses will have been reduced a little bit, but since most of the southern hemisphere is made up of oceans, nobody could really tell the difference in real life. For what it's worth, I'm content that the dew line disproves all the maps that have the North Pole at one of its edges or corners. So we are really reduced to one of two models, the circular layout or the globe. You decide. And while you do so, I've got something else you might like to consider. For anyone who's seen the numerous broadcasts by the space agencies, especially NASA, you'll probably recognize this diagram. It's usually displayed at the front of the mission control room during the missions themselves. Specifically, I'd like to take a look at the ground track of the spaceship. For many years, I was content with the assertion that it showed the ground track of a rocket flying in a straight line around the Earth. But after buying a globe and tracing the path, it was fairly easy to see that the path was anything but a straight line. If you watch the track from takeoff in Florida on a globe, it flies northeast up towards Britain, then flies southeast over Europe and down under Australia before flying northeast back up to the US. What's it doing flying all the way up past England, then down to Australia? Sightseeing? You can trace 
that path on a globe as many times as you want. It will never project a straight line. But suppose the Earth to be flat and the circular layout is used. The standard globe model has the Earth divided north to south by 36 longitude lines. Each of them are 10 degrees apart. The meridian line is at Greenwich in London. And if we transfer the same 36 lines onto a circular map, each line runs from the North Pole to Antarctica. The equator makes a good reference point between the two models. Back in globe land, suppose we measure each point on the space shuttle's path as it crosses each line of longitude. We can then measure how far each point is from the North Pole and transfer it onto a circular map so we are showing the same path on both maps. You'll notice that the path on the flat circular map is largely circular. It's a standard orbit or holding pattern for any intercontinental flight. I suggest that any spaceship that is claiming to be orbiting is simply flying round in circles above us. You can try this with any path over the globe. You might surprise yourself how easily they move from one map to the other. Now you can see the same path shown on a square map and on a circular map. You ask yourself which one seems the most likely. I came across that little anomaly when I first came to Flat Earth and it was only when I stumbled upon a gentleman who was asking NASA about the wiggly flight path around the globe. The gentleman at NASA seems to have been so evasive that I thought on the problem in a little more detail. In other words, suppose for a moment that the Earth was flat and circular, would the path make more sense? Alex Gleason's map is by no means the only circular map that can be used to model a flat Earth. Anyone looking at circular flat maps can see that the layout is constant between all of them, so it's unlikely that any of them are grossly wrong. The only reason for favouring the Gleason layout is that it's a fairly clean diagram, but any individual choice is yours to make. There's one final point I'd like to make. While Antarctica seems to present enough problems in itself, especially since nobody has been down there to see it for themselves, the North Pole is suspiciously quiet. Anyone who's taken a cursory look at the matter knows that the geographic North Pole is not the same as the magnetic pole. The geographic pole is somewhere high in Greenland, and most maps of the world show the North Pole to be nothing but Arctic Ocean. Aside from some vague history of expeditions there during the last century, we don't really know much about it, but there is a clue that most of us have probably already heard but generally dismissed. I'm referring, of course, to Mount Maru. It's generally passed off as something from ancient mythology, and I thought much the same thing at first, but on closer inspection there may be more to it. The Flatwater Flat Earth Channel did a wonderful programme about the Arctic Treaty, in which he managed to trace some 17th century writings between John Dee and Gerardus Mercator. Yes, the same Mercator who gave us the globe. In amongst the writings, there are references to what exists up there, and a number of maps, including this one. As I said a moment ago, much of this seems to have been chalked up to mythology, but a closer look reveals that the continents surrounding the North Pole are those that most of us will still recognise today. Specifically, Asia, America, Greenland, and even the northern parts of Britain, Scotland, and Iceland. While Mercator seems to be viewed with contempt among most flat earthers, it is worth noting that he was a cartographer by profession. I find it hard to believe that his maps of the North Pole are some figment of his imagination for a number of reasons. The magnetic lodestone, which is Mount Maru, offers a perfect explanation for the magnetic pole of the world. It is the only credible alternative to the liquid iron core that keeps shifting, so we're told that we should only use GPS to navigate. Mercator's North Pole also shows the incoming waters that rise to four heads, 
that are corroborated by the biblical accounts in Genesis. Let's remember that the Bible was only translated into German, Mercator's home language, in the middle of the 16th century, and so it's unlikely that he took his rivers from that source. Given that the prime meridian now runs directly through London and Paris, you'll see that on Mercator's map it falls some 20 degrees west of its present location. It doesn't take much skill to overlay Mercator's map of the North Pole over the Gleason layout and rotate it back so that the prime meridian and the continents of Asia, now Russian territory, and America match. The net result is a more complete map of the land masses and a North Pole on a flat circular world. I've taken the liberty of retracing the layout to make a single map of the land masses and to provide a single reference that might be used until something better is created. I've also added one more inclusion from the Gleason map because I've not noticed it anywhere else. In the bottom right hand corner of his map Alex Gleason notes that during the December solstice, when the sun is at its most southerly point, there is no sunlight beyond 80 degrees south, and so everything beyond that point is in perpetual twilight. I've shaded the map accordingly. See what you think of it. So, in closing, the dew line and the intercontinental flight paths seem to preclude any map which has North Pole at the edge or the corners. The only models that work are those which have Canada and Russia facing each other across the North Pole. The only contenders are the circular layout and the globe. That's your decision to make. It's a little late in the day for people to still be claiming that without a map the flat earth has no case to answer. It may well be countered with the same assertion that the globe doesn't have one either. The surface of the earth whichever model you choose to use is too big for anyone to go out and map it in its entirety. For now, we will make the best we can from the information available. The world that you think you know has very much been hidden before your eyes. Globe or disc it is limited by the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic Circle. You're kept very much in the middle. I don't go a bundle on numerology and gematria. But that's not to say I don't find it interesting and I'm reasonably certain that many of the hidden things in this world are hidden by people who really do put their faith in the arrangement of numbers. So to that, let me add an observation that while many notice that the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn are at 66.6 .6 degrees from the mapped poles, it's also worth noticing that the Arctic and Antarctic circles are at a very precise 66.33 degrees from the equator. What do numbers have to teach us about the people who gave us the globe? Thanks for listening. Most of us are reasonably happy with the answers we have so far. The flat earth seems to be holding up well, so I ask you to think back to the globe for a moment. The sun has been set rather nicely at the centre of the solar system, and its path between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn has been accommodated by tilting the earth's axis relative to the sun. Once a year, regular as clockwork, the sun seems to move from one to the other and back again. So let's turn our thoughts to its partner in the sky, the moon. Again, it appears most nights and we take it for granted that it does what it does. So I have a question for you. How fast does the moon travel around the earth? Most of us have lived with the commonly held belief that it takes about 28 days, and it seems about right. We've all heard about the lunar month, and it seems like a good idea, but when did you last take a good long look at the moon? 
Most people think that the moon takes a month to travel around the Earth, and that it travels west to east. After all, each night it's further east than the night before. But rather than checking from one night to the next, how about going out and watching it for a couple of hours in one night? Do you notice something? Yep, it's going the other way. The moon actually goes round the Earth in a little over 25 hours, slightly longer than a solar day, and so it seems to lag behind the sun. We've all heard the old stories about the tortoise and the hare used to describe how one is slower than the other. So the appearance that the moon is travelling in the opposite direction to the sun only occurs when we're too impatient to watch the moon for a few hours. All right so far? Here's the kicker. The moon also travels from Cancer to Capricorn and back again, but it does so in one month. Yeah, go and take a closer look. Did you ever wonder why the moon moves north and south over the month and then comes back again? It's kind of smart, but let's not let it slip under the radar. If you've got your head around flat earth, this shouldn't phase you too much. It really is no different to what we know of the sun's movement, except that it does it every month rather than once a year. Give this one to the Globers and see what they make of it. They're still not sure where the moon came from, so don't hold your breath, but from a global point of view, it looks like this. By the space of one month, the moon moves from here, to here, and back again. Don't take my word for it, go check it for yourself. If you go to timeanddate.com and step through the day by the hour, you'll see it for yourself. It's slightly slower than the sun. You can then watch it over the next month and you'll know where it's going from day to day. Once you see how fast the moon moves around the earth, the moon phases reflecting sunlight are senseless. For the globe, the moon mimics the movement of the sun and there's a big difference. The movement of the sun is claimed to be caused by the tilt of the axis of the globe relative to the sun. The moon has no such claim to rely on. Any claim that the tides affect the moon mean nothing to any of this. There is no correlation between the tides and the tropics. The tides just don't change that fast or as regularly. It simply doesn't work anymore. So there you go. A riddle to be figured out. Take it to the globe, see what it makes of it. They're surprisingly quiet on the matter. On a globe, it has no explanation. The link between the tides and the moon is on life support. Maybe this warrants a closer look. Thanks for watching. Let's take a moment and have a look at another side of Flat Earth. The title has nothing to do with bad language, although it is perhaps worth thinking on for a moment. It's not really for any of us to call someone out about their use of bad language. I come from a decidedly working class background. Some of you may even hear the hint of an accent in my speech. So I'm not particularly bothered by other people's use of bad language. At times, and used in the right context, the odd curse word can be extremely effective. But if we believe we have something to say to others, should we not bear in mind that they might not be so understanding? That's okay as far as personal taste goes. But if they take exception to your words, how likely are they to listen or to present what you say to someone else? I'll spare you the think of the children plea, but how many people would present a well-reasoned argument by a guy who tells us that their opponents are effing retards? How important is it to you 
that the things you have carefully crafted into a fine argument are then heard and understood by as many people as possible. Are we shooting ourselves in the foot before we've barely left the ground? Butting off selling that, otherwise I begin to sound like my grandmother. So on we go to deeper things. It takes little more than a quick glance into the realms of science to realise that it's been swamped in technical terminology. Yes, there are times when certain terms have very specific meanings, but in many cases, technical terms do nothing more than mystify a subject. Why tell someone they cause you cognitive dissonance when you really mean they make you sick? Another commonly used term is confirmation bias. Again, some psychobabble term that simply means favoritism. Aren't megacryometeorites simply big hailstones? And isn't Gegenschein just moonlight? Let alone the fact that it's not even an English word. For our communication to be effective, it needs to be understandable. If we want to convey our thoughts and ideas to someone else, why do we not say so simply? 21st century humanity seems to be suffering from a chronic case of big word disease, and one wonders why we should use one syllable if three might make us sound clever. To borrow a sentiment from my grandmother, it's not big and it's not clever. There's something else that we seem quite happy to do, and that is to abbreviate things or to use initials to the point that one needs a dictionary to follow a conversation. I really don't want to turn this into a NASA bashing. I think they've done that quite well enough for themselves without me adding to it. But consider that we have everything from the Discover satellite that's not even spelt the way it's spoken and implies that it's out in the cosmos finding lots of new things that are then boldly announced before the world. Go and have a look at the Discover satellite and see what it's really doing. You'll soon realise that it's not some guy snapping the wonders of the universe on his iPhone and sending them back for all to enjoy. At best, it sends a bunch of metadata back down to the guys on the ground and they turn it into something straight out of Photoshop, depending on how they choose to interpret it on the day. And I'll spare the various translations of the word NASA. Take a cursory look around. You'll find it. Then ask yourself why an organisation, spoken of in glowing terms, chooses a name for itself from an old Aramaic word meaning deception. Perhaps a little more chilling is the fact that the Vatican spends a considerable portion of its wealth to sit on top of Mount Graham in Arizona inside a giant telescope called Lucifer. What are they thinking? A third problem seems to lie in the fact that we are apt to overuse some words to the point that their meanings are robbed of their value. Two that spring to mind are the words dome and firmament, which at present are used often and interchangeably when they are really two different concepts. If you go and take a closer look at both of those words, it may help to avoid some of the confusion about the roof above this world. A third word that seems to have sprung back to life is the word sinusoidal, that all too many people seem happy to use to describe every wavy line that suits their argument, and as if to lend some authority to what they say. The word sinusoidal is simply a mathematical term. It describes a wavy line on a particular type of graph, and not every wavy line is sinusoidal, so why don't we stop using these words when they're wrong? In most cases, they're simply nonsense. And so, in closing, perhaps we could be a little wiser about the use of words in our language, and consider what they really convey to the person who hears them. It pleases me to think that what I say should be heard by as many people as possible. And so why would I express the things I say in terms that people can't understand or that some people simply find offensive? 
Next time you listen to someone's explanation of the world around you, consider also the nature of the words they're using. A closer look might yield better results from the meanings of some of the words they use. Thanks for listening. There is a word that for some makes the hairs on the back of their neck stand on end. It shocks some people and have, has others reaching for the first chance to change the subject and talk about something else. I'm speaking of numbers, one of the few subjects that some people run from at the first opportunity. I delayed opening this subject for a moment because there are some who think they have a psychological blind spot when they see numbers. It has very little to do with mathematics being complicated. Most people who have an aversion to mathematics have usually been told at some point in their lives that they will never understand it and that they are in some way psychologically incapable of grasping it or they have some blind spot for numbers. It's generally done by someone like a maths teacher who should know better and, in a word, they're talking nonsense. Anyone who is capable of going to the local shops to buy something and is able to pay for those goods and check their change does not have an aversion to numbers. Real number blindness is incredibly rare. Average day-to-day -day mathematics is not complicated. And as I've said, anyone who tells you that it is, talks nonsense. Basic mathematics is no harder to understand than simple grammar, but for some reason, best known to some of the teachers of this world, mathematics has been mystified and some, some sacred art only to be understood by a chosen few. And so we return to the flat earth. You don't need any complicated numbers to understand the essentials of flat earth. In fact, there is really only one calculation that's needed, and it's not a hard one. I speak, of course, to the curvature calculation. Never before has there been such controversy over one mathematical argument. The calculation for the curvature on a globe really is a simple one. That if the earth were a globe, with a circumference of 25,000 miles and you stood anywhere on that globe, the drop below your eye level can be calculated by squaring the number of miles to an object and multiplying the answer by 8 inches. It will give you the drop in inches and if you divide the inches by 12 it will give the answer in feet. It really is that simple. For some reason People are not satisfied that the matter is that straightforward and variously try to use trigonometry which is generally used for working with small precise numbers and only serves to complicate answers that then need to be rounded out. It's totally unnecessary for the purposes of calculating the drop on a globe. Others, for some reason, Hark back to the fact that Samuel Rowbottom used the calculation when he published his book, Earth Not a Globe, in the middle of the 19th century, and as if to say it was a long time ago, so it can't be correct. So let's dispel a few myths. First and foremost, the truth doesn't have a shelf life. The calculations for curvature haven't changed over time. Although various scientists have sought to muddy the waters by variously claiming that the Earth is not a sphere, but an oblate hemorrhoid or some other pear shape. I'll address those matters later. Others have occasionally sought to discredit Rowbottom in an attempt to discredit the calculation, as if to say he was a Freemason so his maths must be wrong. So for the record, let's clear the matter up. In the late 19th century, Samuel Rowbottom used the familiar calculation as it was provided to him by the Encyclopaedia Britannica. 
It has been variously restated by subsequent authors right up until the 1960s, when the flat earth seemed to drop from the radar for a while after the space adventures of the time. The Encyclopedia Britannica quoted the calculation in an item called levelling, that by squaring the number of miles and multiplying the result by 8 inches, you'll get the drop below eye level. The same calculation is cited by countless other reputable publications of the time too. There has been something of a recent contender in this particular argument, where some have suggested that the fall in distance should actually be even more pronounced. Unfortunately, this recent edition seems to miss a rather glaring error. Anyone attempting to explain globular arguments should not miss the fact that if you are standing on a 25,000 mile globe, at any point you will always stand at a right angle to the surface of the globe, for that is what gravity dictates. And as such, all calculations can rightly imagine that you are at the top of the globe and can be made accordingly. There have been one or two who have attempted to rewrite the calculation for the curvature of a globe and seem to succeed in doing nothing more than throwing a jumble of mathematical formulas into the mix that serve only to confuse and deter others from looking further. It's worth pointing out that in many cases the proponents of complicated numbers don't seem to understand the calculations themselves. Rather, they seem to parrot what someone is given to them and speak as if they're some great authority. The reason I cast doubt on what these apparent great minds have to say is simple. Most of them don't seem to know the first meanings of the terms they use. When someone expresses something as tan to the minus one, which is just a mathematical term, it's nothing more than a parroted reading of something they've seen written in a book. Anyone who truly understands those formulas would, in the first instance, speak of them in plain language. So I'll end here where I came in by stating that the mathematics and numbers needed to follow flat earth really is not a complicated subject, except for those who choose to complicate it for the purposes of showing others how clever they think they are. In short, anyone wishing to explain something to someone else should do so in terms that are clearly understood. If you choose to explain something in a way that can't be understood, I ask you, who's the fool? I really don't think there needs to be any doubt as to the calculations of curvature for a 25,000 mile globe. The calculation works. It is as practically accurate as it needs to be. No amount of YouTube amateur mathematicians with or without their rulers and compasses, can alter that fact, and we might be wise to accept the calculation as read and move on to more important things. It looks like this mapping puzzle is not going to go away. The objection that is regularly thrown at flat earthers is that without a map, there's no case to answer. And I recall saying some time ago, that we don't need a map, but it's a nice thing to have. So let's try and pick this up where we left off. For those of you who've listened so far, you may recall that back in episode six, I showed why I thought the flat circular layout provided the only realistic alternative to the globe. The dew line that was built across the top of Canada seems to preclude all the flat earth maps that have the north pole at the edge or at one of the corners. I also recall saying that I've seen no credible evidence for the giant waffle that needs everything to fall off one edge, missiles and all, and pop back up on the other edge. So I'm inclined to dispose of the giant waffle post haste and move on to more important things. The story so far seems to suggest that the only real layouts that might work are the flat circular maps, or it's back to the globe again. 
they seem to show the same thing, except that one of them has a curved surface and the other is flat. There are hundreds of reasons to believe that the surface is flat, and each of us have preferences about which ones are sufficient to prove it to ourselves. Most people seem to like Alex Gleason's layout. Once you get past the pointless objections about spelling mistakes, it's fairly easy to see what goes where. But let's be clear here. There are dozens of maps that claim to show what the Earth looks like. The United Nations map and its various spin-off agencies was designed in 1948. The Hammonds Age map that was made in 1943. Alex Gleason's map was made in 1892. Samuel Rowbottom's layout was made in the 1860s. And this French map was made in 1781. There's even this oriental map that's claimed to date back to the 10th century. From time to time, other maps also seem to pop up, showing the same layout beyond the Antarctic Circle. And while some also claim to show more land beyond the Antarctic Circle, it's hard to give them any credibility beyond some wishful thinking. The limits of the Antarctic really are as far as we can go for the time being. It seems that the world that's bounded by the Antarctic Circle shows a fairly consistent layout, but there are one or two things that need looking at a bit more closely. I'm going to use Alex Gleason's map again as a start point, because it's a fairly clean map, but it contains a lot of additional information that I don't really need for the moment. So let's see if we can simplify things. Alex Gleason's map is claimed to have been created as the basis for a timekeeping device that he patented at the end of the 19th century. And while it's an interesting proposition in itself, we really only need the mapped land masses for the purposes of building a map of the world. Most people recognize it as it stands, but let's see if we can clean it up a bit more. The first thing is to trim the extras away for a moment and rotate the map so that the prime meridian runs down from the middle. For anyone who can't hear an accent, I live in the UK and I've grown accustomed to working with the map this way around, but you can turn it any way that suits your purposes. To simplify things further, I've retraced the layout so that we can concentrate on the land masses and add the bits we need as we go along. It shows the land masses that most of us recognise, with the Antarctic running around the outside edge, and the North Pole at the middle. I've also taken the liberty of putting Mount Meru back at the North Pole, and based on Mercator's map as an alternative to the blank, empty space that the globe seems to suggest. One of the ways by which the detractors seem to explain this layout away is to claim that it's nothing more than a projection of the globe. If you believe that the world is flat, I would suggest that it's really what Alex Gleason states it to be. It shows the world as it is, and that in reality it is the globe which is a projection of the flat circular world. This layout does still present us with a few problems though. Specifically, that some of the distances still seem to be off, and perhaps some of the land masses are not quite where we think they are. I suppose the first place to start is to take a closer look at the scale. If we go to the bottom of Alex Gleason's map, there's a scale that most of us have seen, but not really thought about too closely. Nowadays, most people seem content to accept the metric unit of kilometres as their basis for measuring distances, but they're a fairly modern contrivance, and hopefully most of you still have a working sense of miles. Alex Gleason's map shows two scales, side by side, using nautical miles and English or land miles. Nautical miles are generally used for navigation at sea or in the air, and need not concern us too much here, except to say that they are built on the globular model, 
that used the stars to navigate out on the oceans where there were no recognisable points of reference. Modern GPS seems to have done away with much of that, although any good navigator will understand the difference. Nautical miles also work well for the globular model, which uses units that are multiples of 60, that work well with circles but are not much use anywhere else. If we look a little closer at the scale, you'll find that there are 60 nautical miles for each circular degree, and is convenient only because the degrees on any circle are subdivided into sixtieths and the units work well together. All circles are divided into 360 degrees. Take a look at any protractor and you'll see that they are all the same. The scale on Alex Gleason's map shows that each degree on the map corresponds to 60 nautical miles but a closer look shows that 60 nautical miles is the same as 69 land miles, with which most of us are reasonably familiar. So each degree on the map is equivalent to 69 miles. I'm going to work with land miles as it's something that most of us are familiar with, and most of us could go out and get some sense of how big a land mile really is. There are many circles on Alex Gleason's map, but there are only two places on the layout where we can define a scaled circle around which we could measure out 360 degrees, around the edge and around the equator. Using the scale on his map, 360 degrees, where each degree is 69 miles long, would give us a circle that measures 24,840 miles. Is that figuring any bells? It should do. For all practical purposes, it's the length of the equator around the globe. I don't want to get too waylaid with numbers for a moment, as it seems to put some people off. I'll ask you to accept my numbers for a moment, as I'm more concerned to give an overview of what they might really mean, and I'll show the number sheets at the very end for those who'd like to see them in more closely. I'm not one for coincidences, so if the length of the equator on the flat circular layout is the same as the globe, we might be heading in the right direction. Let's see where they go. If we accept that the equator is the right length, it means that the diameter of the circle that is bounded by it would be a touch under 8,000 miles, and so the diameter of the whole flat circular layout would be a touch under 16,000 miles. One step on from there would give us a total circumference for the flat circular world as a shade under 50,000 miles. It's interesting if you take a look back at the voyages of James Cook and see how long he took to sail around the Antarctic. When most of us first encountered the flat earth, we generally accepted polar distances as given and one of the biggest criticisms to date of the circular map is that it seemed much bigger than the globe. Two and a half times bigger to be precise. But if we now use these smaller figures, we can work out that the surface area of the circular map is roughly 196 million square miles. A cursory search for the surface area of the globe will show that it's pretty much the same size. There will undoubtedly be a few detractors will shout that the globe is about half a million square miles bigger. So to provide some context, half a million square miles is about the size of Sweden. The difference between the two models is the size of Sweden. For all practical purposes, they're the same size. If we dig a little deeper, it throws up something else that might interest you. On a flat circular map, the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic Circle are both a touch over 66 degrees from the equator, areas that the likes of you and me are unlikely to ever visit, but it gives us a band around the edge and around the North Pole that is off limits. If we take the total surface area and subtract the central section that is bounded by the Antarctic Circle, it shows that the area outside the Antarctic Circle covers some 48 million square miles. 
and with the Arctic covering a further 3.5 million, it means that of the total surface area of the world, there is a little over 26% that's off limits to you and me. That is one quarter of your world that is out of bounds, but with a globe that seems to suggest that it's just some chilly little zone at the top and one at the bottom. So I ask a question, how much of your world do you really know? It seems almost incredible that so much of the world could be hidden before your eyes, but it might not be as hard as it first appears. By whatever means the flat circular world was hidden, we have to acknowledge that it was done with some considerable thought, and that many of the great minds of this world have not so much lied as they've massaged the truth. The countries that are spread around the world certainly exist, so the globe can't be a complete fabrication, rather that the truth has been pulled and pushed to fit their model. Pressing on. If the surface area of the flat circular world is the same as that of the globe, why do some of the distances seem so wide of the mark? Surely they can't be that wrong. In truth, I'm not sure they are that wrong. I just don't think we always look as close as we should. We base our sense of scale on the figures we're given, rather than what they might really be. So let's see if we can tighten things up a bit more. If we accept that the surface area is pretty much on the mark, the only difference is the placement of the land masses themselves. We can keep the equator where it is on the flat circular world. That seems to measure up for the time being. But I invite you to think back to episode 6 for a moment and recall the exercise where I drew the circular map, then wrapped it around a ball. Keep that idea in mind for a moment and take another look at the globe. For the sake of familiar terminology, let's stick with calling everything inside the equator as the Northern Hemisphere and everything outside of it to be the Southern Hemisphere. The globe is just a ball whose circumference matches the equator, so the top half will be the Northern Hemisphere and the bottom half will be the Southern Hemisphere. If we take the Northern Hemisphere on a flat map and use it to cover the top half of the ball, everything would have to expand. And if we took the Southern Hemisphere from the flat map and wrapped it around the bottom half of the ball, everything would necessarily shrink. In a nutshell, turning the flat circular map into a globe means expanding the Northern Hemisphere land masses and shrinking those that are in the Southern Hemisphere. Another way to think about how the map has been distorted is to consider that on a flat circular map, the southern hemisphere, which is everything outside the equator, has an area that is three times that of the northern hemisphere. On a globe, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere are the same size. So to make the flat circular map into a globe with the same sized equator, means that the areas in the Northern Hemisphere be doubled in size and those in the Southern Hemisphere be dropped by one third and hey presto, you happy globe. Anyone who's familiar with the Gold Peters projection will know that there is some controversy about the actual sizes of the continents. To wit, that the imperialistic Northern Hemisphere continents were expanded by Mercator and the Southern Hemisphere continents were reduced. If the Gaul Peters projection has any truth to it, the globe becomes decidedly small when it comes to accommodating more accurate landmasses. In short, they don't fit. Our flat circular world has been distorted by expanding the northern hemisphere and shrinking the southern hemisphere. So I have another question for you. If the world has been distorted, how has it been hidden? It's really rather easy, but before we go any further, I'd like to add something else to the map. On the basis that the equator seems to be the correct length on this map, we can dispense with any further need to convert circular measurements into distances 
and use the map to provide its own scale. The equator on the flat circular world gives us a diameter of about 8,000 miles. If we use that distance as a yard stick, it's fairly easy to scale it up and provides us with a fairly accurate scale that can then be used to measure any other distance on the map. I've used this one and split it down to 1,000 mile steps that can then be used to measure the flat distances between points on the map. I've also marked off the distances in kilometres for those of you who prefer metric units but I'll continue using miles for the sake of continuity. It seems that the illusion has been to make the Northern Hemisphere appear bigger and the Southern Hemisphere to appear smaller than they actually are. So to go from the globe back to the flat circular map needs only that we shrink the Northern Hemisphere landmasses and expand the Southern ones back to their proper sizes. If you think for a moment about how we navigate around the world, on the land, most of us don't generally travel far enough for the differences to be noticeable, but in the air and over the oceans, it's another matter. On the oceans and in the air, we never travel directly from A to B. Aircraft and ships are confined to very specific flight corridors and shipping lanes with the exception of short domestic flights by private pilots, pilots don't plan the details of their route beyond putting the destination into a computer called a flight management system, which then controls the plane over the route that it's taken. Flats in the Northern Hemisphere can very easily be made to appear to be longer than the distance from A to B. The Southern Hemisphere is a little different. There are no short cuts on the flat earth, so the southern hemisphere is generally hidden by routing almost all air traffic into the northern hemisphere and then back out again. The travel time is so stretched that it's hard to establish exact distances. If you go to any standard reference, all the distances between different places around the world will be provided and calculated using the globe. They have to be to continue supporting the model. If we're to tighten things up, we can't really rely on the globular distances to figure out the layout of a flat circular world. There have been one or two people who've tried to figure out what the map looks like and all seem to run into problems when things didn't fit. In all cases that I can think of, They've used the listed distances, which have almost certainly been flight distances, and we've seen that with the majority of air travel passing through the Northern Hemisphere, they will almost certainly have been inflated. We might have a little more success if, instead of using the published distances, we consider another method for measuring them. Nobody can go up into the sky with a tape measure and measure the distances, but perhaps we could figure them out more accurately if we used flight times and plane speeds instead. The shorter domestic and continental flights are fairly easy to follow over a flat circular map. So let's take a closer look at the intercontinental flights. The Antarctic is a well-known no-fly zone for regular commercial flights, and perhaps the naysayers who continue to assert that passenger aircraft fly over there every day should take a closer look at the flight regulations. For all practical purposes, it really is a no-fly zone. More recently, the North Pole has entered the fray after NASA declared that radiation at the North Pole means that overflight is not possible there either. So we're confined to the area between the Arctic and the Antarctic circles for purposes of passenger travel. As I've already mentioned, intercontinental flights never fly directly from A to B. They are confined to very specific flight routes, and certain countries are effectively no-fly zones. Pilots don't take off with a map and navigate to their destination. Regular commercial pilots generally supervise the safe takeoff and landing of the plane, and the flight management system controls the entire flight. During the flight, 
the pilot is available to deal with emergencies and if necessary to change the route if required and if permitted to do so by the air traffic control. Once the plane has left the ground, most passengers spend the bulk of the flight sipping cocktails or coffee until they fall asleep. Once airborne, the scenery becomes pretty monotonous and there's not much to see once you get above the clouds. Flying over the flat, circular world doesn't provide quite so much scenery as one might expect. The weather and the time of day can make a big difference to how far you can see once you get up into the sky. But if we take a perfectly clear day, there is a rough calculation that pilots and scientists use to gauge visibility, and that at 35,000 feet, which is the average height for an intercontinental flight, its visibility is about 170 miles. That means that at any point over the Earth, you can see no further than that. For all practical purposes, once you're over the oceans, there is nothing to see, no pun intended, and your only real point of reference will be the pretty display on the back of the seat in front of you. You really are flying blind. So, to return to our flying times, let's look at the matter in another way. There are really only two flights that the naysayers make much noise about. The non-stop flight from Santiago, which is in Chile, to Sydney in Australia, and the flight from Johannesburg in South Africa to Perth, which is also in Australia. If you do a quick search for the flying routes for each of these flights, you'll generally get the globular interpretation and little else. There is no alternative for those who still think we live in a little ball. Given what I've said so far about the actual visibility from an intercontinental flight, our knowledge of how accurate those routes really are becomes somewhat questionable. So let's go back to basics. If we accept that the flat circular layout is credible and based on the length of the equator, the distances I've used are actually quite realistic we can take another look at those flights and see what we can find. I'll do the easy one first. A direct flight from Johannesburg to Perth can be measured to be about 6,700 miles. The service is provided using Airbus A340-600 aircraft that have a top speed of 608 miles per hour. The flight is scheduled to take 11 hours and 10 minutes which means the plane can cover 6,789 miles with no appreciable help from tailwinds. A direct flight from Santiago to Sydney is a bit more demanding. The scale distance can be measured to be about 9,700 miles. The service is provided using Boeing 747-400 aircraft, which also have a top speed of 608 miles per hour. The flight is scheduled to take 14 hours and 10 minutes, which means the plane can cover 8,613 miles, but leaves a shortfall on the scaled distance of about 1,000 miles. Given that the 747s are not plopping into the ocean off the coast of Australia, I'm inclined to suggest that the times and distances can be tweaked in a number of ways. I based all the calculations using the published specifications and suspect that they probably have tolerances over and above those that are given and so planes probably fly a little faster or when not fully loaded. I've also not taken account of prevailing wind speeds which can help reduce flight times or increase the distance covered. Anybody who's taken an eastbound flight across the Atlantic knows that the flights generally gain about an hour on a six hour flight against their published times that are credited to favourable tailwinds. The Abu Ishmael channel offered a very credible explanation to account for favourable flight times around the southern oceans where there are consistent high speed winds that can provide an advantage when flying. 
colloquially, they're known as the Roaring Forties and certainly help to add to the distances covered. Finally, I'd like to offer one more factor that might serve to mitigate the shortfall. Australia might not be where we think it is. That's no idle speculation. If you go to timeanddate.com and take a look at the angle at which the sun rises, I'll use Sydney at the equinoxes for a moment, you'll see that the sun approaches Sydney from a 90 degree angle and suggests that Sydney is much closer to the equator than we are given to believe. I'll talk more on this later. The flights I've used here really are the extreme. They are the longest direct flights and if you go and search for flights between these destinations, you'll soon find that they're really quite rare. Most flights between these locations have at least one stop and most have two or three. On the few occasions where they do fly directly, there's not much information about the routes themselves. And while we've generally accepted that they take the route over the oceans on a globe, it's very realistic for them to take a much straighter route over the flat circular map and remain far enough from land for you to have no real idea how close you are to the continents. So, in closing, this map seems to answer some of the questions that the flat circular map seems to bring from those who seek to debunk the map and the flat earth. It is by no means an assertion by me that this is what the map of the world looks like, but it certainly seems to answer some of the questions that we may have about the shape and layout of the world. If the flat circular map is the same size as the globe, and the land masses have simply been distorted, the only difference between the flat circular world and the globe is that one of them has a curved surface and the other is flat. That's your decision to make. If there is any value in this map, we might learn a little more with some help from our fellow flatheads at the other side of the world. Perhaps there's more for us to learn. Thank you for listening. So, here we are again, still on the trail of an elusive map, and we still seem to hear the same arguments going nowhere fast. So what are we to do? As I've mentioned a couple of times, we don't need a map, but it's a nice thing to have. And anyone who's taken a mild interest in the matter will probably have seen enough maps to last them a lifetime. I also recall saying that none of us, myself included, are likely to go out and create a new map of the world anytime soon. But of all the maps that are kicking around, we can probably get a good idea of what's out there. So I'll cut to the chase. Back in episode 6, I showed why I think that the only maps that might help us are the circular maps where it's back to the globe again. The dew line across the top of Canada seems to preclude all the flat maps that have the North Pole at the edge or at one of the corners. If you believe that the world is flat, I would suggest that the circular layout is the only one that gives us a start point. So let's pick this up where we left off. The circular layout seems to date as far back as 1781. That's the oldest reliable map that I can find so far and it seems like as good a start point as any other. The layout seems to have a fairly consistent track record. So let's dig a bit deeper. I'm going to use Alex Gleason's map again, because it's still the cleanest map that I can find, 
and I think it still has a few more treasures for us to find. Aside from being a fairly clean map, Alex Gleason's map is also quite distinctive. That big red border around the edge tends to make it stand out from the others. And perhaps it's because it is rather distinctive that people tend to name this one when the circular map is called into question. You've all heard the disparaging remarks where people have variously referred to it as the Lil Peter Pan model or the Lil Snow Globe map and presumably in some vain attempt to discourage people from using it. Before I go any further, I'd like to provide a caveat. I know there are problems with making a final map. One quarter of the known world is effectively out of bounds. Many flat earthers still seem reluctant to accept any model, but we shouldn't let it deter us from working to solve as much of the puzzle as we can. Some people do prefer to have something to work with, and for that reason, we look closer. Alex Gleason created his map at the end of the 19th century as the basis for a timekeeping device that he patented. I'll deal with the layout in detail in a moment, but I invite you to pause for a moment and think how many agencies use this layout already. There certainly seems to be something in it. It seems that many of the critics direct their objections at Alex Gleason rather than the layout itself. If anyone still thinks this map is so grossly wrong, I would challenge them to go and bang on the door of the United Nations and ask them why they have a Lil Pizza Pan map for so many of their agencies. I recall saying some time ago that some men really do have a thing about size, and as such, do any of us really think any country would have allowed themselves to be portrayed as significantly smaller than they or their neighbours really are? It seems unlikely, so the UN map might be a fairly good indicator that we're on the right track. If we take a look at Alex Gleason's map, we can see that it was created as the basis for a timekeeping device that he patented in the 1890s. Unfortunately, it seems like the copy we have is the only surviving original, courtesy of the Boston Library. It's a little trashed, but if you do a patent search, it's fairly easy to see exactly what its purpose was. The map, which forms the central section of the chart, was created by one J.S. Christopher, but there seems to be no information available about this particular individual. Any claim that modern college is a misspelling of Morden College, which is just outside London, is equally credible given that the map appears to have been designed in England and then printed in the United States. It's not unreasonable for the US printers to have assumed that Morden was a misspelling and to have made the correction themselves. In either case, Morden College was originally opened, quote, for the poor merchants and such as have lost their estates by accidents, dangers and perils of the seas. So it's quite reasonable to conclude that whoever J.S. Christopher was, he or she is quite likely to have had some considerable experience of the oceans and the mass of the world. And while the critics of Morden College now seem to paint it as being full of dribbling pensioners, it has a very credible pedigree linked to world navigation. I've trimmed Alex Gleason's chart as far as the border, because I thought it might be nice to see exactly what Alex Cleason did create, and in the hope that it will provide a solid point from which we can take a closer look. In the top left-hand corner, Alex Cleason states that the chart is a longitude and time calculator. If you do a patent search, you can find these instructions for yourself, but I'll ask you to accept my assertions for a moment, and I'll put the patent application at the end for those of you who would like to see it a little closer. The chart was originally built with two arms that are pivoted near the center. They look like they're slightly off center, but a closer look will show that they're fixed this way so that the scales on each arm run directly from the center of the map along the lines of longitude. Essentially, both arms are the same, and each one has a scale that's divided into sections to represent latitude markings, 
and working in both directions from a zero point at the equator. Around the outside of the chart is a scale that shows longitude markers in 5 degree steps and longitude lines at 15 degree intervals. So the first function of the chart to calculate the longitude for any location needs that we simply rotate one of the arms so that the graded edge runs through the location that we're looking at. The exact location can then be read off the chart as a coordinate. By way of an example, let's suppose we use Philadelphia in North America. By rotating one of the arms round so that it runs through Philadelphia, we can see from the main grid that it stands on the 75 degree line. And by reading the latitude marking from the scale on the arm, we can see that it lies at a latitude of 40 degrees north. The full coordinates for Philadelphia are longitude 75 degrees west and latitude 40 degrees north. It really is that simple. The time calculator is just as easy, almost painfully easy. Take any two locations on the map that you want to compare and rotate each of the arms so that one arm runs through each location. The tips of the arms end at the clock scale around the edge, so the time difference between the two locations is shown by counting the numbers of hours between the two arms. Again, by way of an example, let's suppose we want to compare London and Philadelphia. If we rotate the arms so that one rests over each location and count the hours between them, we'll see that they are five hours apart. The calculation part comes by using the scale around the outside edge like a clock. A spring washer keeps the arms the same distance apart, in this case five hours. I'll assume that we're in London at 3pm and rotate the arms so that the later arm is moved to 3pm on the clock dial and the Philadelphia arm will show that the time there is 10am. Remember, some countries use daylight savings time. As complicated as it may have appeared, Alex Gleason's time chart really is that simple. In fact, if you take a look at the patent application, he states that it really is simple enough for a child to use and no harder than reading the time from the face of a clock. If you take a closer look at the patent application, you'll notice that the accompanying map doesn't have quite as much detail as the poster version that most of us have seen. I can only hazard a guess as to why there's so much more information on the poster version, but given that no one else seems to have staked any claim to it, I'm inclined to believe that it was developed a little further when the poster version was produced to include some of the additional information around the main layout. Alex Gleason also seems to have been sufficiently satisfied that the entire layout was his invention to have placed his name at the top and to add the title that it serves as a new standard map of the world. As I said a moment ago, Alex Gleason's map is remarkable largely because it's quite distinctive. It seems that much of the opposition appears to be directed at Alex Gleason rather than the layout itself. So let's see if we can take some of the heat out of it and concentrate on the facts. The best copy that we have has the remains of one of the original arms. A nice touch, but a bit of a distraction for our purposes. So let's get rid of the arm and clean it up a bit. If we trim all the extras away, we can concentrate on the map itself. And if I trace the layout, we can pull the map away and it's no longer Alex Gleason's map. In fact, it's nobody's map now. All I want to preserve is the layout of the land masses themselves. I'll explain why in a moment. I've also taken the liberty of putting Mount Maru back at the North Pole as an alternative to the blank, empty space that the globe seems to suggest. Much of the detail comes from Mercator's maps of the 16th century while modern science seems to suggest that the North Pole has sunk in the last 500 years and Father Christmas has moved his elves and his operational headquarters to Lapland. 
We now have what is generically referred to as an azimuthal equidistant projection. And I'm quite particular to use that word at this stage because in Alex Gleason's patent application, he states that the longitude lines from the globe have simply been straightened out. So let's take this one step at a time and not judge him too harshly. We have a flat disc that shows the land masses around the world. For our purposes, it's as good as any other map of the world. It shows the principal land masses in relation to each other, and it's flat. So I'd like to call Alex Gleason up one last time before we let him rest in peace and take a closer look at his patent application. When someone files a patent application, the date that it's filed is recorded to avoid people stealing an idea while an application is processed or pending. As such, the date that a patent is filed and the date that it's finally allowed to stand are usually some time apart. It's the date allowed that matters most because it's the earliest date that the invention is considered to exist. The more eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that the application date and the allowed date are some six months apart. Now you know why. If you want to patent something that includes parts that were invented by someone else, you must cite the patent number for each of those parts. You can't put a new patent on someone else's invention. You can only patent your own bits. When you apply for a patent, your application must cite the patent numbers for any part of your design that was made by someone else. At the bottom of many patent applications, you will see the numbers for those patents that are cited. So let's see if anyone else thinks Alex Gleason's layout is credible. If you run a search on the internet using Alex Gleason's patent number, you'll find that there are three patents that use his map. All granted in the 1970s for a device called a Universal Planisphere Complete Guidance and Computer System that was invented by one William A. Eisenhower. A planisphere is a flat map of a spherical surface. A planisphere and a globe both show the same information, except that one of them is flat and the other is spherical. If you believe that the Earth is flat, it's reasonable to accept that a planisphere serves the same purpose as the globe does for those who still think we live on a little ball. That's your decision to make. The planispheres we've seen so far are all maps of the ground, so I'd like to step away from ground maps for a moment and set our sights a little higher. Several thousand miles higher to be precise. In the same way that the flat circular world has been wrapped around a ball to provide us with a model for the globe, the skies have also been portrayed as a sphere that surrounds the globe, and in the same way that a globe can be shown as a flat circular map, so too can the skies. I know that many people, especially flat earthers, will shout that the skies don't tell us anything about the earth on which we live, but I would beg to differ. The sky, and specifically the sun, the moon and the stars, have long been used in navigation to tell us exactly where we are on the surface of the earth. If we know exactly where the sun, moon and stars are on any date and time, it's fairly easy to establish your exact position on the face of the earth. They provide us with a reference system. In the same way that the ground can be mapped as a planisphere, so too can the skies, and when the two are used together, they provide an extremely reliable indicator of exactly where you are on the face of the earth. So I invite you to think about how we navigate around the world. Most people accept that GPS and local maps will generally get you from A to B, but let's remember that GPS is a fairly modern invention. On the land, navigation is fairly straightforward. In towns and cities we follow roads and landmarks, and out in the open countryside where there are few recognisable points of reference we use a map and compass. Every good navigator knows that following a compass needle seems like a good idea but that it's practically impossible to keep a steady compass while you walk. The correct method to navigate with a compass is to take general compass direction from the map. 
let the compass point in that direction and pick a landmark to which the compass is pointing. Navigation is then as simple as walking to that landmark and any route over the land is simply a case of walking from point to point until you get to your destination. On the oceans, navigation is a little more precarious because there are no recognisable landmarks. The earliest navigation over the seas relied on staying within sighting distance of the land masses. The magnetic compass began to be used for navigation at sea around a thousand years ago, but wind and sea currents meant that sailing by the compass, or dead reckoning, was still quite hazardous for the navigator until reliable clocks were invented in the 18th century. As such, there was very little by which a navigator could be sure of his position on the oceans except for using the sun, the moon and the stars. They are sufficient to help navigators across the empty expanses of ocean until a lookout saw land. Radar was developed during the Second World War to provide radio beacons to mark the coastlines of the world and now, by whatever means, GPS provides a fairly accurate referencing system across the whole world. Most modern navigators rely on GPS, but any good navigator will at least have a working knowledge of the lights in the sky for emergencies. The sun, the moon and the stars all follow very precise patterns in the sky, and if you know where they are at any point in time, they can be used to calculate exactly where you are. Navigation needs only to head in the direction in which the compass is pointing, and use the sun, moon and stars as markers to check that you don't stray too far from your planned course. Knowing where each of them are for any particular time and date has long been calculated by the astronomical and naval institutions of the world, and to find where they are on any particular time and date we use an ephemeris. No, not a feminist, an ephemeris. An ephemeris is a detailed set of tables from which a navigator can calculate their position anywhere on the Earth. Unfortunately, and because the sky is constantly moving, it requires some 20 odd calculations for every single position, and hence the need for good navigators on the oceans. During daylight hours, navigation is reliant on the sun and occasionally the moon. At night, the stars provide so much more information, but the calculations are still subject to mistakes. So in 1975, Mr. William Eisenhower patented his universal planisphere complete guidance and computer system. It looks rather complicated, so let's simplify it a little. Essentially, it's a series of disks that are riveted together so they can rotate over each other. The principal disks show the sun and the moon positions in the sky, and two disks show the principal stars and constellations in the night sky. Another disk shows the surface of the Earth and the principal land masses. If you look closely, you'll recognise the land masses match those that are shown on the familiar AE map. In other words, the AE map and its relative proportions are considered to be accurate enough for the purposes of world navigation. Despite this only having been invented in the 1970s, this navigation tool became obsolete when GPS was rolled out in the 1990s. It did go into production for a short time, but I was only able to find one that is still in existence. The plans here can be found on the original patent application, but they don't do it much justice, so I figured it might be nice to see what a real one looks like. It measures 16 inches across, so as you can probably imagine, it doesn't contain, nor does it need to show, any inland details. For all practical purposes, it needs only to show the coastlines of the world continents. Remember, ships stop when they reach the land. For anyone who takes a moment to look at the patent application, you'll read that it can be used to show which lights in the sky are above which points on the Earth, and conversely, which points on the Earth are below the various lights in the sky. It shows what the sky looks like from the ground. So, in closing, 
the flat circular map of the world seems to have a fairly reliable track record for the purposes of navigation around the world when coupled with the lights that we all see in the sky. Given that one quarter of our world is still effectively out of bounds, this is certainly not an assertion by me that this is what a full map of the world looks like, but it does seem to add one more piece to the puzzle. If you believe that the world is flat, I would suggest that the flat circular layout provides an accurate indication of how the various continents are placed in relation to each other, but that's your decision to make. The lights in the sky can tell us nothing in themselves of the shape of the earth, but they certainly do provide us with a reliable reference system. Perhaps the lights in the sky have more to tell us. Thank you for listening. Perhaps it's time for a change of pace. We've taken some time to look at the various maps of the world and the layout that some of us think might be credible is the circular layout. It's generically referred to as an azimuthal equidistant projection. And while it still has some questions, it seems to be the best that we can find for the moment. For some reason, this map really does seem to annoy some people and while I'm inclined to think that it serves some purpose, I also think it might be keeping us from making further progress. Most of us can find our way around this map. The land masses that it shows certainly seem to exist, but in the absence of further evidence that can accurately place them in relation to each other, perhaps we should let them sink into the oceans for now and look a little further afield. I'll leave Antarctica there for the time being, so that none of us go falling off the edge. There may well be land beyond there, but I've seen no credible evidence, and for me to offer an opinion would be nothing more than idle speculation, so I'll leave it there for now. We do have some reasonable grounds to believe that at least this much of the Earth does exist, and back in episode 10 I showed that it has roughly the same surface area as the globe so it might be a good place to start. A blank canvas, if you like. With a surface area of 196 million square miles, and in the absence of any recognisable land masses, we need some means to reference things. So try this for size. For those who still think we live in a little ball, you may be familiar with the notion that a typical globe has an axis that runs through the middle from the North Pole traditionally at the top, to the South Pole at the bottom, while a flat disc has the North Pole at the middle, running to the south around the edge. All circles can be divided into 360 degrees. Take a look at any protractor, you'll see that they're all the same. A typical globe has 36 longitude lines, 10 degrees apart, running from the North Pole to the South Pole and the disk maps show the same information, but generally stick with using 24 of them placed 15 degrees apart. 
These lines are imaginary, but world navigation seems to agree that the line that runs through Greenwich and Paris is accepted worldwide as being the start point or prime meridian. But for our purposes, the prime meridian is academic. You can start anywhere you choose. There is another imaginary line called the equator that runs around the middle of the globe. On the disc, it follows a midline between the North Pole and the edge. Both models seem to agree that the equator is roughly the same length, about 25,000 miles. Running parallel to the equator, there are also imaginary lines called latitude lines running east and west around the globe. But for the sake of simplicity, let's just stick with the lines that are 30 degrees and 60 degrees on each side of the equator. On the disc, the same lines form concentric circles around the North Pole. Any point on the Earth can be shown by providing a longitude coordinate and a latitude coordinate. The point being where the two lines meet. So we now have a reference system. But for our purposes here, all I need are latitude lines. Any latitude on either model will show you how far you are from the North Pole. And at this moment, that's all we need, even for those of you who still think we live on a little ball. By a couple of clicks with your mouse, you could find your own latitude anywhere in the world. Latitude lines serve as well as a reference because they're a navigation tool based on the lights in the sky. Back in episode 11, I show that the lights in the sky have been used by navigators for many centuries. Indeed, they were used on the oceans right up until the middle of the 18th century, when reliable clocks began to develop. While many modern navigators now rely on GPS, it's notable that a number of the naval institutions around the world have returned to teaching celestial navigation. So let's come see what all the fuss is about. The word planisphere simply means a flat map of a spherical surface. The flat circular map of the world has been wrapped around a ball to provide a model for the globe. And in the same way that the flat circular map of the world can be shown as a ball, so too can the skies. This is an astronomical planisphere. It's a flat map of the sky above the Earth. To the casual observer, the lights in the sky are something that most of us take for granted. Barring bad weather and chemtrails, we can see them every night and don't generally pay them much attention. If you're like me, the first time this caught your attention, you went rushing to the internet to see exactly which stars you were looking at and were probably overwhelmed by the whiz-bang websites that shows a host of fast-moving animations and complicated star maps that leave us with more questions than answers. So let's put the brakes on and take a closer look. For most of us, this will be a fairly new subject, so I invite you to listen to my assertions, and I'll put some plans at the end for those of you who'd like to try this for yourselves. I'll show you the plans to make your own planisphere. While the astronomical priests of the world would have us believe that the lights in the sky are some mystical subject from among the dark arts, astronomy is remarkably simple, but not to be confused with astrology that seeks to confer special powers on the lights in the sky that are understood by a chosen few who charge us lots of money to tell you what they mean. Thank you, but we'll stick with what we can see for now. An astronomical planisphere comprises two disks that are riveted together so that one of them rotates over the other. The top disc is transparent to provide a window called a ground mask through which you can see part of the sky above. The disc underneath is called a star map or sky map and shows the lights in the sky. The manufacturer of this particular planisphere, Philips, have been producing these things for well over a century, so we can be reasonably content that their information is accurate. Unfortunately, I'm one of those people who has an irresistible urge to find out how things work. So, once I got my hands on this thing, my first instinct was to pull it apart. But those nice people at Philips went one better 
and made a glow-in-the-dark version. It seems like a good idea, but it's not as practical as one might think. The window tends to look rather busy, but it does have one advantage, that I can pull the whole ground mask off and see what's underneath. Cool, eh? With the ground mask removed, you can see most of the sky in one go, but let's not anticipate developments. Any half decent astronomical planisphere will look like this and contains the same essential elements. The bottom layer, the star map, shows the month of the year around the edge, and inside of that it shows the days of each month. Depending on the manufacturer, some show each day of the month and some show them in two or three day intervals to keep the layout simple. The difference matters little. Printed on the top layer, the ground mask, are the 24 hours of the solar day and a window that allows you to see parts of the sky through a circular window that shows the limits of your horizon. Although you can't really see it here, there's a faint blue cross at the middle of the circle to show you, the observer, in the middle. I'll mark it here with a red dot to make it a bit clearer. A closer look will show that the cardinal compass directions, north, east, south and west, are also shown, but the more observant among you will notice that they run in the opposite direction to a standard compass rose. That's because it's showing what the sky looks like above your head. The first thing that most people realise is when they see something like this is that the sky is humongous. We only see about one quarter of the total sky, and ground masks are produced to show the sky at a particular latitude. This one is made to show the sky above the 51 degree latitude line anywhere around the world, but it's sufficient to show the sky for a good 80 degree radius around that point, and shows the sky above Northern Europe, North America and Canada. So let's see what's up there. If you're standing on the Earth, anywhere along the 50 degree latitude line, and look up, this is the sky above your head. You're the dot in the middle of the ground mask, and this is your horizon. If you look at the times of day around the edge, and rotate the time of day to match the date, it will show you the sky immediately above your head. This far north, we can see Polaris at the centre. If we pick January 21st for a moment at 6pm, this shows the stars above your head, and as the evening rolls on, and by the hour, you'll see the sky changes. So I have a question for you. The stars above your head are constantly rotating, so is it the earth that's moving or the sky? For many centuries, people accepted that the sky moves above their head until the 17th century when the theories of Copernicus and Galileo set the whole thing spinning and tossed it into outer space. Many flat earthers seem content to accept that it is the sky that moves and that the earth is indeed stationary. So if we keep the ground mask still and let the sky revolve, you'll see that as January the 21st moves along by the hour, the sky rotates above your head. The effect is exactly the same. You're standing still and the sky rotates above you. So let's look closer. The stars that you can see here are called background stars and they all rotate from east to west around Polaris. Hour by hour, the sky rotates above you. In fact, if we pick one star for a moment, I'll use Betelgeuse and let the day progress you'll see that it approaches from the east, it crosses the sky and disappears beyond your horizon to the west. As the sky continues to rotate, it eventually goes all the way around and reappears on your eastern horizon the next day. In fact, it takes the sky 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds to make one full rotation. It's called a sidereal day and everything in the sky rotates around Polaris. The horizon is essentially the limit of our eyesight in all directions and seems to have nothing to do with us living on a little ball. 
so let's take a look behind the scenes. If I remove the ground mask completely, you'll see a map of the sky. It looks a little daunting at first, lots of dots, but there are really only two things in the sky with which we should concern ourselves, so let's try and simplify things. What's shown here are the background stars. They are the stars that rotate around Polaris every day above your head. If you remember that we are looking upwards, all the stars are rotating anti-clockwise around Polaris. A closer look will show that in the same way that the Earth can be divided up with latitude and longitude lines, so too can the skies. The sky has an equator called the celestial equator, just like the Earth. But a closer look will show that the celestial equator is aligned perfectly with the equator below, and so too are the 30 and 60 degree latitude lines. So this map shows us the stars from the North Pole all the way out to the 60 degree line just inside the Antarctic Circle. As the sky rotates, the stars all rotate in the same direction. Yes, even south of the equator. The constellations in the sky are little more than dot to dot pictures that man has created to link the stars in the sky to each other. Early Arabic astronomers established some of the first constellations and the Greeks added a few more to make those with which most of us are now familiar. I'm not too concerned here with most of the constellations in the sky except to return to a comment I made earlier that there are two things in the sky that we can use as points of reference. There's the celestial equator and against the background stars there's another imaginary circle called the ecliptic. And while the circle itself is imaginary, it provides us with another reference. The ecliptic has been populated with the signs of the zodiac, pictures created from the background stars. They are nothing more than constellations that are part of the entire background. Beginning with Aries, they run to Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius and Pisces. The ecliptic will give us something to work with in a moment, but let me draw your attention to the constellation that's been formed at the centre of the ecliptic. It's Draco the dragon, and while I don't hold with the stars having any control over our lives, it's worth noting that the dragon is mentioned in the Bible, and it doesn't come with glowing references. The ecliptic forms a circle around the constellation of Draco that's off-centre compared to Polaris. So while everything rotates around Polaris, the ecliptic itself is centred above the Arctic Circle, a shade over 66 degrees from the equator. So let's go look at the stars. I showed you a moment ago that the background stars make one full rotation in 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds, a sidereal day. But man, in his wisdom, has elected to adopt a 24 hour day based on the position of the sun instead. It doesn't seem like a tremendous difference, but it does create a number of noticeable effects. If we use Betelgeuse again for a moment, it takes 23 hours. 56 minutes and 4 seconds to make one full rotation. So in 24 hours it makes a little over one full circuit. In fact each point in the sky travels about 361 degrees in 24 hours. So if I go out and look at the stars at exactly the same time each night, I'll see them gradually drift west night by night. If I watch for a whole year, the day by day drift will end up back where it started at the same time of night and the whole cycle repeats again. Of course the big question the most flat earthers struggle with is the sun, so let's take a look. We tend to look at the sun from the ground, and so we use the ground as our frame of reference, but suppose we look at it in another way. Let's look at it against the background stars. The sun moves along the ecliptic. In fact, it takes a year to travel around the ecliptic. 
so let's remove the ground mask and see what's under the hood. The location of the sun against the background stars is found by laying a straight edge from the centre of the sky to the date we're looking at it. The sun takes one year to travel around the ecliptic, so if all circles can be divided into 360 degrees, the sun travels about one degree per day along the ecliptic. If you look a little closer, you'll see that the ecliptic is the same size as the celestial equator, and the celestial equator is the same size as the surface equator, about 25,000 miles. So the sun travels about 70 miles along the ecliptic each day. So what does all this look like from the ground? If we use December 22nd for a moment and lay a straight edge to that date, we'll see that the sun is just passing into Sagittarius. But remember that while the sun moves one degree per day along the ecliptic, the whole sky rotates 361 degrees around Polaris. So the net effect is that the sun describes this path over the surface of the Earth. Flat Earthers generally know that except in North Pole, we don't see the sun up there for 24 hours. So what does it look like from the ground? If I replace the ground mask and rotate it until the sun is right on the eastern horizon, you'll see that on December 22nd, it's there at 8 a.m sunrise. Over the day, remember that the whole sky rotates east to west around Polaris, so you'll see the sun travel from the eastern horizon to the western horizon, arriving there just before 4pm, sunset. At that point it's beyond the limits of our eyesight to see, and as the light fades you'll see the stars become visible again. I'm not too concerned here with the twilight hours as they seem to do little more than help fudge the length of the day to support the spinning ball illusion. If I remove the ground mask again but leave the horizon line there for reference, we get the best of both worlds and can take a closer look at the ecliptic. Looking upwards as the year progresses, the sun moves one degree per day clockwise around the ecliptic so that by the middle of March it's in the constellation of Pisces. If we take March 21st, you'll see that it crosses the eastern horizon at about 6am, and the whole sky rotates that day, taking the sun across the sky to pass the western horizon at about 6pm for sunset. By the middle of June, the sun is just entering the constellation of Gemini, and from the ground, you'll see that it crosses your eastern horizon at about 4 a.m. The sky rotates around Polaris, and the sun crosses the sky to the western horizon, arriving there at about 8 p.m. We are now at the height of summer north of the equator, and the path across the sky is over the Tropic of Cancer, the summer solstice. By the middle of September, the sun has progressed even further around the ecliptic, and is now entering the constellation of Virgo, where it'll cross the eastern horizon at about 6 a.m. and crosses the sky to the western horizon at about 6 p.m. By the end of the year, the sun is back where it started, heading into the constellation of Sagittarius, with sunrise at 8 a.m. and passing through the sky above the Tropic of Capricorn. It provides summer again, south of the equator. So let's recap the story so far. North of the equator from the middle of winter, the sun crosses your eastern horizon and takes this path through the sky above the Tropic of Capricorn to your western horizon. In the spring, it crosses your eastern horizon and takes this path through the sky above the equator and sets in the west. By the summer, north of the equator, the sun crosses your eastern horizon to pass over the Tropic of Cancer during the day before setting at the western horizon. It then continues to head away from Polaris through the autumn equinox and finally by the middle of the northern winter it's back where it started and rises above the Tropic of Capricorn one year from where we began. It seems like a fairly credible reason for the change of seasons during the year so I'd like to add one or two extras to this for people to think on until next time. 
There's no need here for me to complicate things any further than to show where the sun is at the equinoxes and solstices. I'm sure you're now able to work out where the sun is as it passes from one to the next as the year progresses. So I'd like to take one more look behind the scenes before I close. One subject of much argument among flat earthers is the notion that the sun needs to somehow speed up over the Tropic of Capricorn. I would suggest that there's no need for it to do so. The sun travels around the ecliptic at a steady speed of about one degree, about 70 miles per day. Additionally, the whole sky rotates once in 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds. The fact that the sun appears to cover a longer path over the Tropic of Capricorn is nothing more than a consequence of us measuring its path by ground speed. Its speed in the sky looks pretty constant from here. So, in closing, I appreciate that for most of us this subject is still fairly new and takes a slightly different approach to a problem with which we've wrestled for some time. As such, it's probably a good place to finish for the moment and provide people with some time to digest these things before we move on to take a closer look at the moon and the wandering stars that we colloquially call the planets. And finally, I'd like to provide a caveat. An astronomical planisphere is an observation tool. I have no doubt that the people who make these things think we live on a little ball but I think the Earth is flat, and this thing seems to show me exactly what I can see in the sky. So let me preempt the naysayers, who will say that planispheres for the Southern Hemisphere show something different. Let me counter it only with an assertion that they appear to show exactly the same thing. We appear to be looking at the same sky, with the same stars, going in the same direction. But that's your decision to make. You'll recall that at the start of this episode, I said that I'd show you the plans for a planisphere so that you could make one for yourselves and take a closer look. The Canadian National Research Council have produced a Northern Hemisphere planisphere for anyone to download and make. If you go to their website, there's a link to a PDF that you can print out on two sheets of paper make a planisphere for yourself. I'll put the link in the description box below. When you print the document it will give you two pages that look like this. Cut out the circular star map and cut out the frame for the ground mask. You'll also need to cut out the circle inside the horizon to create the ground mask itself. Once they're cut out fold the flaps along the dotted lines and slide the star map into the frame. I found it made things easier to then tape the whole thing by the edges to a sheet of card that allowed me to hold the card while I rotate the star map. There, you're ready to go. On the basis that you can only see the stars at night, this particular model shows the hours between 6pm and 6am, but it's a good place to start and take a look at the sky for yourself. Simply align the date with the time of day and it will show you which constellations are above you. Remember, you're standing at the centre of the ground mask. As the evening progresses, you'll see all the stars rotating from east to west across the sky and it will give you a feel for what's going on up there. Next time, we'll take another look at the sun and we'll also take a look at the moon and the wandering stars. In the meantime, take a look for yourself. Back in episode 7, I offered you a riddle about the moon, that it appears to travel from the Tropic of Cancer to the Tropic of Capricorn and back again, like the sun does, but it does so every month. Aside from a few naysayers who offered their usual objections, Nothing of any substance was offered. The basis for my assertion was the information that those nice people at timeanddate.com provide us with, but I'm not sure their information is as accurate as they'd have us believe. So let's look a bit closer. 
so that we can all get our bearings. Most people are familiar with lines of longitude. On a globe, they run from the North Pole, traditionally at the top, to the South Pole at the bottom. And on a flat disk, they run from the North Pole at the middle to the South around the edge. The traditional globe has a line called the equator that runs east and west around the centre of the globe. On a circular map, it follows a mid-line between the North Pole and the edge. There are more latitude lines that run parallel to the equator, but for the sake of simplicity, let's stick with the lines that are 30 degrees and 60 degrees on each side of the equator. On the disk map, the same lines form concentric circles around the North Pole. There are two more lines, about 23 and a half degrees, on each side of the equator. They are colloquially called the Tropic of Cancer to the north and the Tropic of Capricorn to the south. On the circular map, they are just inside the 30 degree line and will provide us with a useful reference later. Latitude lines provide us with an indicator to show us how far we are from the North Pole. And by a couple of clicks with your mouse, you can find your own latitude anywhere on the surface of the Earth. Yes, even for those of you who still think we live on a little ball. For our purposes here, we can dispense with the lines of longitude. The lines of latitude provide us with all the information that we need for the moment. Back in episode 12, I explained that a planisphere is a flat map of a spherical surface. The flat, circular map of the world has been wrapped around a ball to provide a model for the globe. A planisphere and a globe both share the same information, except that one of them is flat and the other is spherical. In the same way that the surface of the Earth can be modelled as a globe, so too can the skies. Some of you may be familiar with this model. It shows the sky surrounding the globe. And in the same way that the Earth can be shown as a disc or a ball, so too can the skies. This is an astronomical planisphere. It's a flat map of the sky above the Earth. I don't want to get too waylaid here with the question of whether the sky above our heads is a dome or some other shape except to say that there appears to be a structure of some description above our heads, and that will be sufficient for our purposes here. An astronomical planisphere is an observation tool. It shows what the sky looks like from the ground. It comprises two disks that are riveted together so that one rotates over the other. Any half-decent astronomical planisphere will have the same essential elements. The top disc is transparent and has a window called a ground mask to show the limits of your horizon and through which you can see part of the sky above. Although you can't really see it here, there's a faint blue cross at the centre of the window to show you, the observer, in the middle. I'll mark it here with a red dot to make it a bit clearer. I mentioned back in episode 12 that while this model glows in the dark, it's not as practical as one might think, but it does have one advantage, that I can pull the whole ground mask off and see what's underneath. The bottom layer is generally called a star map or sky map. Around the edge, you can see the 12 months of the solar year, and inside of that, you can see the days of each month. Depending on the manufacturer, some show each day of the month, and some show them in two or three day intervals. The difference matters little. I'm going to stick with using this particular model as it lets me see most of the sky in one go. The centre section is a map of the lights in the sky, but it looks rather busy, lots of dots. So let's see if we can simplify things. The stars you can see here are called background stars with Polaris at the centre. Looking upwards, the whole sky rotates anti-clockwise, east to west around Polaris. Yes, even south of the equator. And in the same way that the surface of the Earth can be divided up with latitude and longitude lines, so too can the skies. 
the sky has an equator called the celestial equator. But a closer look will show that the celestial equator is about the same size and perfectly aligned with the equator below. You can see which stars pass above which points on the Earth. This particular sky map is big enough to show the sky from Polaris, which is above the North Pole, all the way out to the 60 degree line just inside the Antarctic Circle. Like the surface of the Earth, the sky is also divided up with longitude lines, but given that the sky is constantly rotating, those lines have little to do with those on the surface of the Earth. But we'll take a closer look at them in a moment. Around the edge of the ground mask, it shows the 24 hours of the solar day and can be rotated to show which stars are above the observer at any time of day or night. Remember that you can't see the stars while the sun is above your horizon, but they are still there. The ground mask also shows the cardinal directions, north, east, south and west, but a closer look will show that they run counter to those on a standard compass rose. That's because they're showing what the sky looks like above your head. You'll also see that the observation point is at the 51 degree latitude line. But for our purposes here, it's good enough to show us how the sky passes over the Earth for a good 80 degree radius around that point. The only reason different ground masks are provided for different locations around the world is to accurately show astronomers which part of the sky is immediately above them. If I rotate the ground mask so that the time of day matches the date, it will show what the sky looks like above my head. And as the day moves along by the hour, it shows the sky rotating above me. The sky makes one full rotation in 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds. It's called a sidereal day. But since man has decided to use a 24 hour day, based on the movement of the sun, the sky makes a little over one full rotation each day. In fact, each point in the sky travels about 361 degrees in 24 hours. It's worth mentioning here that some flat earthers appear to have concluded that the sidereal day was invented to hide the fact that 24 hour days don't work for a spinning ball. Let me counter only with the suggestion that people go out and take a closer look at the sky for themselves. It's not just the sun that travels around each sidereal day, the moon and the stars do too. By way of an example, let's suppose we pick one star for a moment. I'll use Betelgeuse and watch it for a whole day. You'll see that it approaches from the east, it crosses the sky and it sets in the west. In fact, it continues beyond your western horizon and continues all the way around until it arrives back on your eastern horizon the next day. If we let the whole process repeat again, you'll see that if we look at the stars at exactly the same time each night, they gradually drift west as the year moves along, and eventually, one year later, the star that you're looking at will pass the eastern horizon at exactly the same time of day and the whole process is repeated again. So let's look closer. If I remove the ground mask again, we can take a closer look at the sky. I mentioned a moment ago that the sky is divided up and can help us to find our way around. The celestial equator is immediately above the equator below and divides the sky into two areas that are north and south of the equator. The sky also has meridian lines, running from Polaris at the middle to the south around the edge. There are 12 prominent meridian lines, and given that all circles can be divided into 360 degrees, these meridian lines are spaced 30 degrees apart. The latitude lines in the sky form concentric circles around Polaris, and like the surface of the Earth below, they are referenced using degrees that work from zero points at the celestial equator. There is another reference in the sky called the ecliptic that's about the same size as the celestial equator, about 25,000 miles. It's easy to identify 
as it's been populated by the signs of the zodiac. They are nothing more than dot to dot pictures that are part of the entire background. Beginning with Aries, they run to Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius and Pisces. If I bring up the meridian lines, you can see that the sky is divided into 12 sections and there is one zodiac sign for each section. It's useful as it gives us a better idea of where to find things. The astrologers of this world might be able to help us here as they look at the sky as a self-contained system. Each of the 12 sections are called houses and each one is named for its dominant zodiac sign. One of the things that many flat earthers struggle with is the sun. So let's take a closer look. We tend to track the sun based on our position on the ground, but let's suppose we look at it in another way. If we look at it against the background stars, our position below needs nothing more than for us to know how far we are from the center. We can then look up and know what we expect to see. Looking upwards, the sun travels clockwise along the ecliptic. In fact, it takes a year to travel around the ecliptic. So if all circles can be divided into 360 degrees, it means that the sun travels about one degree per day along the ecliptic. The position of the sun on the ecliptic can be found for any day of the year by laying a straight edge from the center of the sky to the date that we're looking at it. So let's suppose we start with December 22nd. You'll see why in a moment. You'll see the sun is just entering into the house of Sagittarius, but you'll also recall that the whole sky makes one full rotation that day too. The net effect is that on December 22nd, the sun describes this path over the face of the earth. I'm not going to repeat this for every day of the year, but we can keep track of things if we watch it month by month. If the sun travels 360 degrees around the ecliptic in one year, then it must travel an average of about 30 degrees in each of the 12 months. So if I let the meridian lines divide the ecliptic into 12 sections, we can see where the sun is on the ecliptic month by month. We started on December 22nd, so one month later I can lay a straight edge to January 22nd and you'll see that the sun is just entering into the house of Capricorn. The sky makes more full rotation that day, so the sun describes this path over the earth. By February 22nd, it's heading into Aquarius and it describes this path over the earth. By March 22nd, it's heading into Pisces and you'll see that as the sky rotates that day, the path of the sun is above the equator, the spring equinox. It continues along the ecliptic so that by the middle of April it's entering into Aries and describes this path above the earth. By the middle of May it's in Taurus and describes this path and by the middle of June it's heading into Gemini and you see that the sun's path above the earth is much closer to Polaris than when we started. In fact, if you think back to the surface for a moment, you'll see that as the sky rotates that day, the sun passes over the Tropic of Cancer, the northern sun solstice. By the middle of July, the sun is heading into Cancer, and its path that day is slowly heading away from Polaris again. By the middle of August, it's heading into Leo, and by mid-September, it's heading into Virgo, and its path that day has returned to passing over the equator again, the autumn equinox. By the middle of October, the sun is heading into Libra, and its path over the earth has now moved south of the equator. By the middle of November, it's heading into Scorpio, and by the middle of December, it's heading back into Sagittarius, and its path that day is traveling over the Tropic of Capricorn, one year from where we began. In a nutshell, 
That's the journey that the sun makes over the earth by the space of one year. If I retrace the 12 daily paths that we just saw, starting in mid-December, you'll see that the path of the sun moves progressively from the Tropic of Capricorn to the Tropic of Cancer in June, and then returns in the opposite direction until it reaches the Tropic of Capricorn again one year later. If you watch the path of the sun around the ecliptic, you can see how it travels between the tropics over the space of the year. The daily movement along the ecliptic is too slow for us to notice, but the daily rotation of the sky around Polaris is sufficient for us to observe if we take a little time and have the patience to watch. We've only looked at this by 30 day intervals, but it's been sufficient for us to see how the sky is moving day by day. We used the 12 houses of the zodiac. Each one spans 30 degrees in the sky to cover a total of 360 degrees over the year. But man, in his wisdom, has created a year using 365 days. Don't ask me why. And that's ignoring the leap years that are needed to adjust the clock every four years. If you look closely, you'll see that as the year progresses, the sun ends up slightly out of step with the signs of the zodiac. And certainly begs the question that if the sun is the centre of everything, why is the solar calendar so woefully wide of the mark? But that's a question for another day. If I put all 12 paths on together and replace the ground mask, you can see how the sun sweeps from your eastern horizon to your western horizon each month. While the sun is within your horizon, the sky turns blue and it bleaches out the light from the stars. But as the sun passes beyond your horizon, the stars become visible again. Simple really. So you've now seen how the sun travels along the ecliptic. Well guess what? So does the moon. The planisphere works well to keep track of the sun and it's accurate enough to be used for the whole year. The dates around the edge are provided for a 366 day leap year, but that one extra day is negligible for the purposes of following the sun and the stars. But one can't help wondering why they don't make one of these things to track the moon too. The moon travels around the ecliptic in the same way as the sun, but with a difference. The moon takes one month to travel around the ecliptic and the process each month doesn't repeat itself nearly as regularly as the sun does. You'd need separate planispheres for every month of the year, but before we move on, I invite you to think back to episode 11. The lights in the sky all follow very precise patterns, and anyone who knows where they are can use them to find their location anywhere on the surface of the Earth. They provide us with a very accurate reference system. Did you ever wonder why the alleged GPS satellites are called constellations? The lights in the sky have been used for many centuries by navigators to plot their positions, especially on the open oceans where there are very few points of reference. The naval institutions and the astrological priests of the world have long kept track of the lights in the sky. And if you cross their palm with silver, they'll even tell you where they are. To find the location of the lights in the sky for any time and date, we use a book called an ephemeris. An ephemeris is a book that shows the positions of the lights in the sky for each day of the year. But since the lights in the sky are constantly moving, a new ephemeris needs to be published every year. The first time it's caught my attention was because the front cover tells me that in addition to the sun and the moon, it also shows the position of the wandering stars that we colloquially call the planets. The book itself comprises pages and pages of numbers, but once the initial shock has subsided, it's really quite straightforward. So I invite you to listen to my assertions and I'll put a sheet at the end for those of you who'd like to take a closer look. An ephemeris is a geocentric catalogue that shows where the various lights are seen in the sky for every day of the year. For our purposes here, the positions of the moon are all we need for the time being, 
but there may be a few surprises for us to find. Let's see where it goes. An ephemeris is published every year. Raphael's ephemeris was first published at the end of the 18th century and seems to have a consistent track record for accuracy amongst astronomers. To keep this relatively straightforward, I'll ask you to keep in mind how the sun moves between the tropics and we can build from there. I mentioned a moment ago that the sky is divided into 12 equal sections, 30 degrees wide, and that each one is named for its zodiac sign. You'll also recall that the sky makes one full rotation in 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds. This is the ephemeris for March 2015. It looks rather complicated, so let's see if we can simplify things. Down the left hand side, you can see the days of the month using the solar calendar. And the next column shows the corresponding days of the week. The position of the lights in the sky each day are given for midday at Greenwich in London. The next column shows the corresponding sidereal time compared to Greenwich, but it doesn't really concern us here for the moment. The next two columns have a little symbol at the top, a circle with a dot in the middle. It's the standard astronomical symbol for the Sun, but we've already seen the Sun using the planisphere, so we can skip it for the moment. Like the Sun, the Moon also travels around the ecliptic, but it does so in one month. The Moon travels much faster around the ecliptic than the Sun does. In fact, it travels about 13 degrees along the ecliptic each day. You'll recall me saying earlier that each house of the zodiac covers a 30 degree span of the sky, so the next column shows how far the Moon has travelled through each house for each day of the month. I've plotted the moon positions here for every day of the month, but for our purposes here, we really only need to watch a few key points. If we start with March 1st, you'll see that the moon is in Cancer. And as the sky rotates that day, the moon describes this path over the surface of the Earth. Somewhat conveniently, it's near the Tropic of Cancer. By March 7th, it's reached as far as Libra, it describes this path over the face of the Earth, and you'll see that it's just past the equator. By March 14th, it's reached Capricorn. It describes this path over the Earth, and you'll see that it's approaching the Tropic of Capricorn. By March 19th, it's reached Pisces, and describes this path back above the equator again, and it finally returns to Cancer on March 27th, and we're back where we started. You'll see that by the space of one month, the Moon travels from the Tropic of Cancer to the Tropic of Capricorn and back again. In the same way that the Earth uses latitude lines to show positions relative to the equator, so too does the sky. But in the sky, the word declination is used instead to describe how far a particular point is from the equator. I don't want to complicate matters any further for the moment, but for those of you who want to take a closer look, the positions on each of the dates that we've just used can be confirmed in the declination column to show how the moon travels between the tropics each month. If I trace the moon's path, you can compare it to the sun's ecliptic path, shown here in yellow. You'll notice that they are slightly different from each other. The Sun's ecliptic path above the surface of the Earth seems to be parallel with the surface below. The ecliptic path of the Moon is not parallel to the surface of the Earth, it's at an angle of about 5 degrees to that of the Sun. As the Moon circles above the Earth, sometimes it's higher than the Sun and sometimes it's lower. The Moon's position above or below the Sun's path is shown in the Moon's latitude column, and the column marked as Node is simply the point where the two paths cross. So let's wrap this one up for now. Most of us have lived our lives believing that we live on a little ball flying through space. 
everything we know has been based on that assumption. So once we realised that the earth is flat, we all have to start again with a blank sheet of paper. The sun, the moon and the stars all seem to provide a remarkable clock in the sky and each of them can provide us with different pieces of information about the world in which we live. And finally, one issue that's frequently thrown at flat earthers is that we can't explain the cause of lunar eclipses. You've all heard the old mythology about invisible monsters gobbling up the sun and the moon and used to provide much material with which to ridicule the flat earth. So try this one for size. On the front cover of the 2016 and the 2017 ephemeris, it tells us that it shows the location for the black moon. And whatever it may be, the astronomers of this world certainly seem to know where it is. They even have a name for it. They call it Lilith. Apparently, Adam in the Bible had a first wife and her name was Lilith. And while I'm sure she's not whizzing around the sky above our heads and creating lunar eclipses, the black moon certainly seems to be a very credible notion among the astronomers of the world. Perhaps we can take a closer look next time. Thank you for listening. I introduced you to the planisphere back in episode 12 um, and really it's just a, it's a map of the stars in the sky it's got a ground mask that shows the limits of your horizon so although the sky is quite big 196 million square miles um, you can't see all of it and the parts of it, that are of it that are in daylight, you also can't see. So what the ground mask does really is it helps you to narrow down how much of the sky you can see and you can give some sense of how big the individual constellations are. Um, many of us, if you go and look up constellations in books, they're shown to you in isolation. Uh, they don't really give you any sense of scale of how big the constellations are. So it can be a bit daunting when you go outside and have a look at the sky and try and find your way around. When I kicked off, I clicked, kicked off with the glow-in-the-dark planisphere. And the reason I did the glow-in-the-dark planisphere is because I can pull the whole sky map off, or the ground mask off, and you can see the entire sky. Um, and this particular one goes from the North Pole all the way out to 60 degrees south, which is just inside the Antarctic Circle. So it was a good model to work with, but it's got its limitations. It's the one that while it being luminous, it seems like a good idea for when you're out at night looking at the stars. It makes the um, ground mask window look very busy. And sometimes it can be quite hard to find your way around things. Um, but worse than that is it chops off the last 30 degrees of the sky around the edge. Oh, it was a constant source of annoyance. And what I was surprised about is I got the usual objections from people about what directions the stars go. People telling me that 
the southern hemisphere stars go in a different direction to the southern hemisphere stars. So I did what any sensible person would do. I went out and bought one for the southern hemisphere. So what you've got here is two planetspheres, one for the northern hemisphere and one for the southern hemisphere. Um, and I did actually put these up the first time I introduced them and kind of hoped that people would look when I said that we seem to be looking at the same sky. Um, on first glance, they look fairly innocuous. They look like they're both showing one side of a ball. Um, one's shown the top, the other one is shown the bottom. Look at the window and the ground mask. One of the more noticeable things is that the window for the southern hemisphere is much bigger than the window for the northern hemisphere. Um, it claims to cover the same sized area. So unless people in the Southern Hemisphere have a magical sight and they can see, I worked it out about 1200 miles, they can see 1200 miles further than people in the Northern Hemisphere, there's something wrong with this. But if you look a bit closer, you'll also notice that the months on the Northern Hemisphere, the one on the left, the months on the Northern Hemisphere go clockwise around the year. The ones on the Southern Hemisphere go anti-clockwise. So if I take any date and starts at midnight, as the night goes along by the hour, you're going to see the Northern Hemisphere stars will go anti-clockwise for this, and the Southern Hemisphere will go clockwise. But take a closer look the Western Hemisphere and the Eastern Hemisphere. Look at where they are. On the Northern Hemisphere, the Western Horizon is on the left and the Eastern Horizon is on the right. Whereas on the Southern Planisphere, the Eastern Horizon is on the left and the Western Horizon is on the right. So, anti-clockwise and clockwise is really neither here nor there. The stars are going from east to west on both models. And the way it's been done is they seem to have flipped the map around. Okay, on the northern hemisphere you've got the north pole or the north celestial pole in the middle. On the southern hemisphere you've got the perceived south celestial pole in the middle. Well of course the stars are going to go in the opposite direction. You're looking in the opposite direction. But this is not some idle academic exercise. Um, I live in the Northern Hemisphere. I live about 50 degrees north. So if I look south, I can see Orion in the winter months. And you'll, the thing you'll notice about Orion is it spans the equator. So I can see the top of Orion and I can see the bottom of Orion. Guess what? The stars on both are going in the same direction. They're going from east to west. So it might serve our purposes if we can get away from this clockwise, anti-clockwise thing, because clockwise and anti-clockwise are relative positions. I think we'll make life simpler for ourselves if we stick with east to west and kind of find our way from there. It might give us a better feel for what's happening up in the sky. So the glow-in-the-dark version had one redeeming feature, is it showed me the sky from the North Pole or Polaris at the centre, all the way out to the 60 degree line. Um, but that was really that was really about as far as it went. So I went back to the original, um, this one. It's a much clearer map. It's not as it's not as bunched up and the information. You don't get everything trying to leap out at you at once. Um, but some of you may recall me saying when I first got onto this that I have an annoying habit of wanting to know how things work. So here you go, a busted planisphere. Um, for one reason and one reason only, I get to see the sky map that's underneath and I get to see the whole sky map in one go. And in the same way that I busted open the northern hemisphere one, I did the same thing for the Southern Hemisphere. So I've now got two sky maps, one for the Northern Hemisphere, one for the Southern Hemisphere. 
um, showing me the whole sky as it's seen from different parts of the world. I don't want to get too bogged down in whether the sky above our heads is a dome or a disc or whatever shape that it is, other than to say that there appears to be a surface of some description up there to which the stars are attached or in which the stars are suspended. It's really neither here nor there. The fact is there is a sky up there and there are stars in the sky. What it allowed me to do is it meant I could then take the Northern Hemisphere star map and using all the stars from the Southern Hemisphere star map I could plot the stars for that last 30 degrees around the edge. So I'd end up with a sky map that showed the whole sky in one go. And this is what it looks like. There's deliberately no labels on it. Um, because I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Um, around the edge, you've got the months of the year that I'm not going to use at the moment. Um, they'll be more useful later when I put the uh, ground masks on. But I'll, I'll explain those in a little while. It's really simple enough that once you can recognise one or two constellations, you can start to find your way around the sky. Um, anybody in the Northern Hemisphere, the most common one you, you'll you have heard of is probably this one. It's the Little Dipper. Um, the Little Dipper is useful because it shows us where Polaris is, and this is Polaris right at the centre. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Big Dipper, which is kind of here. The Big Dipper is actually the back end of the Great Bear. Um, and this is, I don't want to make this into an astronomy lesson. Um, but just, if you have, just have a glance around, you might recognise the shapes of one or two of the constellations. Stars are class classified based on brightness, um, and they start at number zero, and the numbers go up while the dimness goes down. So generally the brightest stars in the sky were category zero or category naught, and then category one was a little bit dimmer, category two was dimmer than that, category three, and so on. Um, but stars, they've been categorised in stars since the middle of the 16th century and gradually as different scales were put together for it they suddenly realised there was one star in the sky that was even brighter than all the, all the bright stars in the sky and it's this one, it's Sirius which is in the constellation of Canis Major um, so they had to Rather than change the whole scale, they had to categorise Sirius as a minus one um, magnitude. Now, the only reason I'm, I'm talking about magnitudes of the stars here is because standard astronomical notation is the brighter the star, the bigger the blob. So, if you look as you look around this, you'll see that some stars are bigger than others. It's because they're brighter than others. And once you start to see where the bright stars are, it makes it a little bit easier to find your way around it. Um, as I said, if you have a glance around, there's one or two, there are one or two constellations on there that you can probably recognise. A constellation is simply a bunch of stars joined together to make a picture. Um, the one that makes people in the Northern Hemisphere probably recognise is this one, it's Orion. Um, and you'll have, see, you'll have seen this in mythology books and you have seen it in kind of junior level welcome to the stars type books um, he stands with his head to the north and his feet to the south you've got his two shoulders and you can see his arm above his head though he hasn't actually got a head and then you've got Rigel and Safe are the two stars that form his feet and the thing that most people recognise is Orion's belt, which is these three stars. And underneath those three stars, hanging down below his belt, 
you've got three tiny little stars that represent his um well that's not mentioned really and the other constellation that we hear much ado about is this one up here it's crux that's crux four stars um the brightest one is the brightest one's actually called mimosa um that's what people in the Southern Hemisphere generally watch and a lot of the legends are made up about the cross in the sky and settling in the winds and all that sort of stuff. We did a little bit about procession when we were talking about the sun and how it travels between the tropics and then we also did when we did the moon as well. Um, the stars process in the same way. The constellations, I've divided them up um, there are 88 constellations in the sky. The ones in green are the ones that are generally called the Northern Hemisphere constellations. You've got the blue ones, which are the zodiac signs. Um, if you've watched anything of what I've done so far, you will really have mentioned those a couple of times. The ones that are in yellow are the Southern Hemisphere constellations. And the ones in red are also Southern Hemisphere but they're the ones that are on the last 30 degrees of the sky. So what it means is I've got a sky map now that shows the whole sky in one go. But you'll notice that the constellations around the edge seem to be a little bit bigger than those that are towards the middle. Um, I can only hazard a guess at why they're like that. What it's effectively giving us is an AE map of the sky. And this map sits directly above circular map of the world below. I don't want to get too bogged down in what the map of the ground looks like because we can't quite decide that between us. But for now, what I've got now is a map that shows the sky and I'll do the ground masks. You'll be able to see which parts of the sky you can see. If you go out and try and find a planisphere that covers the whole sky, um, it doesn't seem to exist. What you'll find is planispheres for different locations based on latitude and the ground masks will show you how much of the sky you can see. Now, how much of the sky we can see is really based on our eyesight. Um, the brighter the stars are, the further are, the further away they are that we can see them. But it actually provides a fairly small circle on the sky that you can see the stars and recognise constellations. Once I started looking at this and realised that the ground masks for the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere were completely different and the, the available um, visibility seems to be grossly exaggerated for the Southern Hemisphere. What I did to go with this star map is I produced three ground masks. Um, I've done one for 50 degrees north, I've done one for the equator, and I've done one for 35 degrees south. So I can lay any of the three ground masks over the sky and it will show me which constellations I can see as the sky clicks on um, hour by hour. If you go out and look for planispheres, as I've said, you've, you've, they're hard to find, especially around the equator. I managed to find one made by a, a manufacturer called Rob Walrecht. Um, I found it on Amazon that it claims to be an equatorial planisphere. Um, it's notable for a couple of reasons. One, they had really bad feedback for their delivery and it doesn't seem to have been resolved. Um, but the only alternative that you'll find for an equatorial planisphere is there's one made for... It seems to be aimed at... It's a Spanish manufacturer, I think. And the way they've dealt with it is they've split the planisphere into what I effectively had with two separate discs. Um, and the problem with doing it that way around is you have to look one direction for looking at the, star the stars in the north and you have to look in the opposite direction for the stars in the south. 
And this is where I think we might be getting caught out in terms of how big the constellations in the sky really are. Um, the only way we can really make a comparison is to stand on the equator and to look at the Northern Hemisphere constellations and then the Southern Hemisphere constellations and get a match for what I've got here. Um, I've seen a few photographs from a few people around the world that have taken photographs of the constellations and they seem they seem to be comparable to the sizes that I've got here. So I'm kind of hoping that when people have had a chance to look at this and get a feel for what's up in the sky, they can go out and actually take a look in the sky for themselves. I've built the prototype for this and it seems to work. Um, because planispheres have the ground mask riveted to the sky map, it can be awkward when you want to start changing them and using them at different locations and there seems to be an awful lot of money to be made out in the world by people selling you different ones based on different locations. As I've said, take a look on the internet, um, search planispheres and see just how many different manufacturers come up. Um, I seem to have got this one to work. I uh, did it with magnets and it works quite well. So I've got a few people testing at the moment and once I'm satisfied that it works, what I want to do is I'm going to make it up in make it up in hard copy and also make it up as an electronic planisphere. And people are then welcome to it. And you go and you can play with it to your heart's content. You'll find your way around the sky. And more than anything, I think it'll just give us a better idea of what's going on up there. One of the things that's frequently thrown into the mix on all this is people say, well, the stars in the sky don't tell us anything about the Earth on which we live. And as I've said before, I'd beg to differ on that. The stars in the sky have been used to navigate around the world for centuries. Um, they're regular. We can, we can take timing from them. We can take locations from them. And all we need to be able to do, really, is find our way around up there. And that's really what I aim to do with this. But I've done it as a bridging episode, um, really to give people a chance to think about things and to really deal with the one, the one enduring question. So the only constellation that gives us any problems for the Southern Hemisphere is Sigma Octantis. Um, so I want to just get a closer look at it for a moment. If you look on the sky map, there are three stars. Two down at the bottom and one up towards the top. I've shown them in green just to make them stand out. They're not really green. Um, they're actually quite dim stars. And these are the three stars that make up the constellation Sigma Octantis. But if we spin it back a little bit, Sigma Octantis, right, the constellation is called Octans and it was discovered in the 1700s by a French astronomer called Nicolas Lacay. And when he discovered it, he catalogued four stars. Um, what history and astronomy and everything else have made of it after that, I don't know. But what you'll notice is the stars are too far apart to make a single constellation. All the other constellations on the map work, including the ones right around the edge. But Octans doesn't work. And the reason it gets used as a um, counter to flat Earth is people say, well, there's a South Celestial Pole, and everybody at the South Pole can see the South Celestial Pole just like you can see Polaris. Well, I don't think they can. The furthest south anybody can go is 35 degrees, and you've seen the um, ground masks that I've made that work for this. I don't think people at 35 degrees south can see that far beyond the perceived South Pole. Um, if they could, there'd be a problem, because anybody looking up and over the South Pole, the other side of the world, would be in daylight. You, only watch, you can only watch stars at night time. 
So somebody on one side of the earth is looking at part of octans from one side of the world, they're not going to be able to see the other side of it. And I think octans, and certainly as an explanation for why we live on a little ball flying through space, is largely a fiction. Um, I can't speak to what people are seeing when they go out there and they look at it. Uh, at best, I would suggest that people can see two stars that are part of octans, and at any time, there's always going to be at least one of them is not visible. So all these marvellously taken, colour-corrected, high-definition, time-lapse photographs and pictures that people put up to say, here we are, this proves the South Celestial Pole, I don't think they mean anything because they don't give us any indication of what they're looking at. But as far as I'm concerned, they are blurry photographs. If somebody wants to prove that there is a South Celestial Pole, they should be able to see those three stars all pulled together south of, south of the South Pole. I think the only place that you'd be able to see this constellation spinning, if indeed it existed, would, was, would be for them to be down at the Antarctic and I don't think anybody is going there anytime soon. So there you have it, a full map of the sky. Um, as I said a moment ago, this is not an astronomy class. There's not a test at the end of it. Um, and what you do with it is entirely up to you. Um, I know the stars don't prove the Earth on which we live or the shape of the Earth on which we live but they certainly do allow us and have allowed us for centuries to navigate our way around. I said at the beginning that this is a bridging episode. Um, so what, I really, what I'd really like to see now is people just have a look at this, see what they think, see if they can formulate some better questions for us to be asking the people who still think we live on a little ball flying through space. And after that, we can go from there. Thank you for listening.